All right, all right. Good stuff. And we are recording. We're good. All right, so um, today's lesson and breakdown, uh, again, we're going to go over the biblical Hebrew real quick. And then after that, um, I have a, a brief lesson called the secret place. All right. Um, there's some things that the most high needs to do in each and every one of us. Um, it's very important in order for us to move forward like we need to. All right. So let me go ahead. Um, again, is my microphone good? Can you guys hear me? You good, huh? All right, good. Yeah, you sound yes. good. Yeah, you're good. 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 Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're good. All right. Let me see if I can get my video going. All right, can you guys see the screen? Yes. All right. I keep forgetting that Zoom be crushing your computer memory, so it takes a little while to get started. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead again, do a brief recap and then go on from here. So again, we're doing the understanding biblical Hebrew one character at a time. Again, uh, this is a direct ministry of Biblical Hebrew Awakening, the birth of a nation. Uh, we're going to go over the Aleph Bet or the alphabet in the Greek. First recap question. Can anybody tell me what this paleographic um, image means? What does this mean? The Hebrew all. Strong leader. Authority. Authority. Authority, strong leader. What else? What else can it mean? Or what other derivatives of that can it mean? Staff. Right. Say again. Staff. Um, authority. The staff is an authority. That's good. Power. Power. Strength. Strength. Power. Strength. Strength. Yeah. Head. First. All right. Absolutely first. All right, so let's go over that again. Again, this pictograph is of a ox head. It, it exemplifies strength, power, um, a leader. It also goes over instruction because when you have an oak and, uh, um, a yoke of oxen together, you have one that's more experienced that leads the younger in the ways of how to plow the fields, right? So... Again, there is the um, Paleo Hebrew breakdown. All right. Aleph, Lamed, and the Pe. Also, Aleph in Arabic. And this is the root where we have Alpha in the Greek. When you have the spelled out Al, which is a Al and a Lamed that signifies, like was said earlier, strong authority, strong leader, strong ruler. Um, those are the functions or those are the, um, the ideas you get of when you think of a, a strong, mighty ox, okay? Pass forwarding. Next one is Bates, Bates. What, someone tell me what, is bait mean? What's the definition of bait? House. 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 Okay. What else? Family. Family. Inside. Inside. What else? Uh, is it like covering? No, but it could be in regards like, to a function of a covering, but um, like protection. It could, depending on the, the context around it, it could, yes. 
Have you ever heard it affiliated with Door? No. Could it be surrounding? Mm, enclosure. Enclosure. Yeah, More enclosure. Than surrounding. But yeah, enclosure. Okay, what else? These are good, good points. I have inside, but I'm not sure if that's from previous notes. That's correct. It's also inside or with or within. Within. Now, um, what I will say is this. What you guys are doing right now is how you should be thinking when you're trying to understand the Hebrew writings, when you're looking at them in the Paleo Hebrew or the pictographic Hebrew. That's how you should be thinking. You should be thinking in those terms. Um, but you, you want to anchor it down and make sure you're looking at what is the function of the pictograph. What's the, the function and the characteristics of the function. All right. So when you break that down, all right, it goes into a tent, house, dwelling place. Now, what resides within or inside the house, tent, or dwelling place or enclosure? It's going to be the family. Right. And so absolutely. Um, that's, that's, um, a situation where you have the, the bait represents family. It represents the house of the family. Um, it's so vitally important that, you know, when you have guests that come into your home, they are now under the covering of your family. They are now one with your family. Okay. So, um, it's one of those things where um, you look at Lot and you look at the Malachim that came to visit him and they were going to go ahead and just lay out and rest in the square. And Lot was like, nah, you don't want to do that. Come into my house in, inside my house, the safety of the house. Right. And so um, again, you basically have it to where um your guests, those friends now dwell within your house. So that's why when you're looking at the um, character or pictographic element of the bait, it references family, home, house, um, tent, enclosure, all right? And um, it also is the root uh, word, I hate saying word, but it's all we can kind of understand. The root word in regards to when you are saying in, with, or within in Hebrew. So like when you say, Bahashem Yahashua HaMashiach. All right, so ba or ba, in, in within, inside right ha being the the shem name name yahushua yah salvation ha the mashiach messiah so a lot of times you got these, the these these folks that you know they they rattle off whether they're they're talking um lashawan kadash or they they're whatever they say you know bahashem yahushua mashiach and you're like what I have no idea what they just said, uh, but now you can at least break that down. What they're saying is in the name of, there's really no of, the modern Hebrew has an of, but in the name, y'all salvation, the Messiah. All right, and so bait also is where we get the Greek beta and get our Latin romanticized letter B is from the bait. It's also where we get the number two. All right, hey, uh, like Zachariah. So you were right. I had mentioned it last time in the chat, but you probably didn't see it. Uh, gams is in relation to legs. Okay, okay. Yeah, it was it, honestly it was uh, it was an old uh, TV show where they were it was in living color, where one woman was supposed to be from the old school days, and she was always black and white in the nineties. And right. she said something about uh, a set of gams talking about legs. And I'm like, where did they get gams for legs? That isn't. And when you said that that was gam and it was foot, it was like, 
since this is the root of all language, yep. like that's what I, it made me think. Hey about. man, I was cracking up when you said that. Though. I'm like, eh, my, my okay. bad. I could put it better. I could have put it better than that. No, you did. A, uh, you but, said it. You said it perfectly. You actually said it perfectly. I thought it was hilarious. So I was like, you know what? I never <laughs> looked at that. But afterwards, I did look it up, and uh, yeah, that's um, uh, a more European. Uh, they basically ripped off um, from the Greek, going back to the Hebrew, gam, and then gamma in the Greek, and then uh, that Latinized, Romanticized uh, gams is legs. So when they say, oh, she got a good set of, of gams, that's, that's exactly what it was talking about, legs. So I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, praise. Yeah, that's cool. How, uh, this is still influencing things hundreds, <laughs> thousands of years later. All right. So again, yeah, um, we had one on this one right there. This is a relation to a foot. All right. The gam. All right. And then also it became the gamma in the Greek. Um, in the Arabic, it's gimo. Hmm. And then the uh, pictographic script to write out gam is the gam and the mem. So combine these reference um, walking to water, assembling to the water, um, drawing to the water, um, that type of situation. And again, here's the breakdown. To see uh, this in more detail, go back to the previous lesson we did last Shabbat to break that down. I'm trying to just kind of go through to get to the next part, all right? The gam is what we get again. The very first one is the early Semitic script. Next you have middle Semitic and then you have late Semitic script, all right? The late Semitic script became our number three. All right, so now we're on to um, new material. All right, so we're gonna take our time through this part. All right, and again, make sure you have your, uh, your pencils and pens ready to go over this because again, um, it's important for us to get this understanding so that in the future, you'll learn how to write in Hebrew yourself. You'll be able to look at the Aramaic or look at the actual um, Paleo Hebrew and understand what it's talking about. All right, so here the, I'm going to just say character. I'm going to try to stay away from word. I might say word still. Um, the character or letter, dal, is related to door. Now, it also has several other meanings associated with it. It can mean a back and forth movement, like a swinging back and forth of a door or a tent door. All right. It also can mean to dangle. All right. It also can mean weak or poor as one who holds their head or dangles their head down low. All right. So the image you kind of get is look at the, uh, the, the top line as a banister or some type of overhang. And then that bottom piece is the flap of the tent door or the door that you come in and out of. It's that tent door, that flap that holds down that you would come in and out of, so to dangle as well. That's the function of a tent door. That's what it does. It allows you to come in and come out. There's movement that goes in and out. So when you're trying to describe something, that's how you're doing it. So for instance, I'm trying not to jump ahead too much, but for instance, when you hear about chariots, right? it doesn't necessarily mean chariots. It just means that is an example of speed at that time. It'd be like if I were to try to describe um, something moving fast, I could probably say cheetah, because um, cheetah's fast, right? I could probably say car or airplane. I have to try to associate whatever I'm trying to talk about with what I can talk about right now, like what I can describe, right? And so like, if you're seeing stuff moving and you know, chariots flashing like lightning, you don't know what that thing is. You just like, it moves like a chariot fast, like, a, like, like fire. 
So you're trying to be descriptive in regards to what it is you're seeing. It's not necessarily always literal. It's more related to the function of a thing than literally that's what it is. And that's uh, where the translations get kind of messed up. Because when you're looking, when the translators are looking at things from a Eurocentric Western mindset, from their culture, they're not, they're not going to fully get it. They're just not. They won't fully understand. Um, they're taking things literally. And so you see scriptures, you like, that don't even make no sense. And it's because they literally translated the text, not looking at the function of what it's talking about. All right, so the sound for the letter dal is D as in door, as well as obviously the Greek and the Arabic and Latin Roman equivalents. All right, this is also, um, you know, transliterates into that. So the early Semitic pictograph character of the doll looks like that in the middle Semitic, which then uh, evolved into the late Semitic. All right, the middle Semitic is where we get our number four. Give me a second, I'm gonna move this out the way. Okay, I can see now. All right, so again, so from the middle Semitic, that evolved into our number four in the Latin Romantic languages. All right, any questions before I move on? Any questions on the doll? Or in modern Hebrew, they say Dalet. Uh, one question: the 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 third from the left that that's also middle, or is it just the two? Uh, not the two, but is it just the second one? So the first one is early. The middle one is always going to be the middle, and okay. then the late is going to be the one on the right. Okay, late. My bad. Appreciate you good? that. No, you're good. I, I try to arrange it so you have basically early, middle, and late. Um, okay. In some cases, like in the uh, future uh, characters, I'll put out the actual um, modern Hebrew or the Aramaic Hebrew, but I'm just trying to keep it simple right now in regards to, so you understand the root, okay? okay. Um, this is your Dalet or your doll, all right? And this is how uh, it progressed over time. Okay. I have a question too. Um, in regards to how the letters or the, the symbols change through time, was it changing because different people was using it or was it, what was the reason for the changing, I guess, from like the pictograph to the late Semitic? So, um, good question. Great question. Um, essentially what it comes down to is all the above, um, we were using it, obviously, other uh, Semitic peoples, Abrahamic descendants and surrounding um, people were using it. And over time, it's just a matter of evolving with the times. Again, you're just looking at the font or the script. Like, so no different than right now, what do you have? You, you can go online right now, download for free or pay to get the English alphabet in like 300 different fonts. So depending on what you want your font to look like, you can pick whatever font you want. And okay, that looks cool. If you're doing marketing and advertising, you can just pick a font and you know um, switch it up and use that. And so what you're having is that different people over time took the root foundation of, of language and they evolved it to fit their culture. Meaning the Hebrew reads from right to left, top to bottom. But the problem you have is that some people decided, you know what, we don't wanna go from right to left. We wanna go from left to right. And so you'll have them take the same character and flip it the other direction because instead of reading from right to left, they're now reading from left to right. Um, I'll tell you guys a secret. 
Some of you guys uh, know this from my past teaching. Some of you don't. Um, in regards to our distant cousins, all right, um, and obviously they're, they're whited out extensively, but the Japanese, the Japanese paternally, it's, that has been tested roughly 75% of Japanese men have paternal DNA that goes back to Shem. When you look at the Japanese kanji script, which really goes back to the Ainu script is the root, the Ainu that have been basically bred out, okay? Or let me put it this way. They've bred themselves out because they're the root. The Ainu actually have their DNA that goes back to Shem. It's a haplotype, D is in Delta or Dao. Um, the Ainu script is a variant of Hebrew, of late Semitic Hebrew. The difference is that they'll have some characters sideways, they'll have some characters upside down. And so now that I've said this, you're gonna look at Japanese writing and be like, oh snap, that's darn near Hebrew. It that's just wild. basically turned it, it turned it upside down or sideways, different things like that. So um, I have to say the closest written language as, as close to the Hebrew as possible is going to be the Japanese. The Japanese or the Ainu, I should say correct, correction, the Ainu script is a variant of Hebrew. Because um, what they don't want to tell you is that there was a split where some of us from the line, line of Shem went to the east and some of us like Abraham went to the West. And then the Hamatic or Kamic folks that were in our land and our territory, Joshua, you know, put in that work and they left and went to the East. That's, you have your Canaanites and your other Asiatic people, Asians that went to the East because they got kicked out by Joshua. Um, but that's a different story. That's a different lesson. Um, Moray, what about the Phoenicians, the Phoenician scripts? Phoenician script is the Hebrew script. It's all one and the same as far as the root. Um, when you go back, you say Phoenician, you say Canaanite, or you say Hebrew, it's all one and the same. Okay. okay. At the root. So again, what you have is over time, um, everybody, okay, I'm going to try to keep it tight. Um, everybody took the root language and mixed it up. So like I said, some decided instead of going from right to left, they're gonna go from left to right. Um, some decided to say, you know what, we're gonna do our own thing and they created their own different language altogether, all right? Um, but it's all rooted in the same. It all has the same root. And so again, over time, every culture basically modified it and, and did it, you know, kind of added on to it. And so like in modern times, right, you have us to where um, Hebraically, as Hebrews, we've taken the English language and we've modified it to create our own sub language. And then they slightly derogatory call it Ebonics, which is a slight jab and some other stuff. Uh, but they call it Ebonics because they know we come from the nigger river thus niggers, right? Um, it's a situation where uh, you have the Ebony, the bony people. So Ebony is not just black, Ebony is a people. There's actually mm -hmm. an Ebony state in Nigeria. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all tied together. That's what it comes down to. All right, um, we're getting to the next two characters, which are really, really popular, really famous um, characters to, to look at. Um, and some of the hardest to break down. So you have the letter or the pictograph, hey. All right. And this is an image of a man standing with his arms raised up or raised out. And this means to behold as when looking at a great sight. It also can mean breath, 
or a sigh as one does when looking at a great sight, like, like basically like, oh, you know, behold, look, imagine the guy that's sitting there. It's a, it's a dude on the earth and the most high cracked the sky open is like, I am. The first thing he's going to do is probably that pose right there and then fall to his face, <laughs> right? That's a look of shock. That's a look of like, oh my, you know, oh my, yeah, I can't even believe what I'm seeing right now. And so again, you're looking at a great sight, behold, breath. Um, you're looking at revelation. You're looking at a revealing. Um, it's like look and see. It gives you that type of, um, of, of understanding. All right. So again, um, this word can mean breath or sigh as one does when looking at a great sight, meaning of the letter of the hey is behold, look, breath, sigh, reveal, revelation from the idea of revealing a great sight by pointing it out, like look and see. So that's the function, that's the character. Let's dig deeper. All right, so again, the sound of that character is the H sound. This is a sound that can be made. Again, every culture and language is going to have a different type of tongue, how they're comfortable speaking. So a lot of times you hear that there's no H in the Greek, but there is. They just don't have a breathy H sound. They have an S sound. So this actually became the Greek character or letter epsilon. That's with an E sound. Now this also is commonly and mainly used as a prefix in your words that means the. As in Hashem. The name. The look, behold. It, it puts a stamp on it, like, look at this, look, behold. The revealing of. So when you when you see or you hear the word Eretz, that means the land, the earth. So again, the hey is going to be at the beginning of a word to, as a prefix, revealing something of importance within the sentence. All right, so on this one, I decided to put the actual um, um, modern Hebrew or the Aramaic Hebrew, or you can say the biblical Hebrew, okay? Um, because most of the biblical Hebrew is going to be in the Aramaic font. All right, so the early Semitic or Hebrew He evolved to the middle Semitic character of He by rotating 90 degrees to the left, which then evolved into the late Semitic script, which you see there below, which evolved to the modern Aramaic we know of today. This middle Semitic is what the Greeks and the Romans, thus the Latins, went ahead and turned to become their letter E. And the number five, it eventually became the number five. Would these so, be one of the characters uh, that's consisted of in the Most High's name? Say like, that again? Clarify that. Like, how you would spell his name out, would this be one of the characters that you would use? This one right here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
I have a question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, from some previous teaching, I had um, a paleo figure that looks like the stick figure, but it doesn't have any feet down below. It kind of looks like a worshiper or like a ghost at the bottom. Have you ever come across that? Um, I have to see it to, to give you a direct answer, but that isn't. That's I have to look at that and see. You have to show me what that looks like to see. Okay. But there, like I said, there's um, a variance between all these in regards to different cultures would modify it a certain type of way um, for their own purpose. You know, but that the first one is the root. And then you go into other ones. So like um, there's additional ones that are rooted in all this. But again, what I'm showing you is I'm showing you the early, the middle, and the late. And then the Aramaic. I, don't, I only have so much space to show you guys that you can actually see it on the, on the screen. But yeah, show me that. Um, send me an image of that. I'd be curious to look into that. Okay. I have a question too in mm -hmm. regards to um the Aramaic. So when we see the, when we see it written in like the modern kind of Hebrew script and that's the yep. that's the Aramaic script, it's not it's not pronounced is it pronounced the same way as as Hebrew or is Aramaic also like another language? No, so that's the thing I talked about last time. Um okay. Aramaic is a font. That's it. Okay. It literally is a font. Okay. It's like, we don't, I, you know, I don't speak Ariel, you know? <laughs> right. I got you. <laughs> or Tacoma or something like that. Like, that's not, yeah. that's not how that works um, when you're talking about the writings. Now, the difference does come down into dialect. Okay. And that is something that we do have to deal with later because everybody's going to have a different dialect, but in general, the sound is going to be similar. Now, when you look at what the Ashkenaz folks did when they tried to reconstruct this is they went based off of the uh, Sumerian texts. They went off of some of the Phoenician texts. They went and said, well, what do these um, Edomites do? So they, they're like, what, what do these, um, how do the Yemeni speak in their, their Semitic language? And so they analyze how they speak. They go to some of the different, um, you know, the different groups to listen to how they speak their version or variant of Hebrew. And that's how they were. They looked at the Arabic as well. How does that, because Arabic is a Semitic language as well. So how do the Arabs speak in the Hebrew? They call it Arabic because they have an Arabic dialect to it, but it's still a variant of Hebrew. Um, it's just an Arabic font. So, um, and that's real crazy when you look at the Arabic, which I, I'm not even trying to even dig into that. I wish I, I, you know, I dug into the Hebrew, the Greek and the Russian. That's my stop. I, I can't deal with the, uh, with the Arabic, but when you look at the Arabic, a lot of their stuff is like cursive Hebrew that's upside down. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy, crazy for real. Uh, but when you look at it, you're like, okay, now it makes sense when you try to deconstruct the Arabic to figure out like what, what these things are. But basically, it's a cursive language. That's why it looks funny. And then it might be upside down and backwards. So it, it's, it's, it's crazy. But yeah, um, the only thing you really have to worry about is depending on where you're going to is the dialect. So like, I'll tell you, one of the things right now that frustrates me a little bit is that you have everybody named mom from the 12 tribes is trying to claim that their language is the original Hebrew, which is stupid. It's ignorant. And it's, it's um, divisive is the word I'm looking for. So right now you got folks from the Congo that want to say, Oh, the Congo is Bantu language is the root uh, Hebrew language and all the other stuff is fake. It's Yiddish. It's the white man stuff. And so they got the truth. And so what they got is all it is. Okay. Then you got folks that are saying, okay, no, Yoruba is, is the root Hebrew. Now you got folks that are from Ghana saying, nope, the Twi is the, is the root Hebrew language and everybody else is garbage and trash. And what you have is you got a bunch of Hebrews from the 12 tribes that are discovering who they are and they're discovering, oh, snap, we naturally speak a variant of Hebrew. 
this word, that word, every other word means this in the biblical Hebrew. They're still using the biblical Hebrew or the Aramaic Hebrew as a root to fall back on. They're just looking at their modern dialect and how they pronounce things in regards to saying, okay, man, we are the people. You know, them Hebrews in, them Hebrews in America are jumping off and they're talking about how, you know, we, we the Hebrew Israelites and by blood we're related to them. Oh, snap. Our language has many key components to the actual Hebrew. But in pride, which is an issue we deal with as people, that arrogance and pride, we really want to come off and be like, no, nah, no, nah, man, that Bantu Congo is, is, the, is the truth. It's all, it's, that's it. And that's all. And everything else is trash. Can't, I can't talk on it. And it's like, listen, we're 12 tribes. We're 12 tribes scattered all over the earth. I'm happy that you found some biblical truth in your language and your tongue. That's awesome. It helps us all out. But we got to stop this um, trying to act like we are the only ones and we got it all figured out amongst those 12 tribes. We're 12 tribes united. We have to be united as one. We can't go through this acting like we are the end all be all of being the Hebrew Israelite. We all have components of the truth and we have to embrace that and embrace each other. We can't have this divisiveness like, you know, uh, the Kikuyu is the only truth or, you know, the um, Kikongo is the only truth or the Luba is the only truth or, you know what I'm saying, the, 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 um, the Igbo or the Yoruba or the Twi or the, like, no, we gotta stop that. We're 12 tribes scattered. You know what I'm saying? And so we have to try to reconstruct this um, as best we can. You have some of those folks that all they speak is Northern Kingdom dialect. Some folks, all they have, they, they literally have the middle, their, their current language heralds back to the middle Semitic Hebrew. So instead of saying uh, Shabbat, they'll say Sabata. Where then you got other folks that are from the Southern Kingdom that actually do say Shabbat. Or Shalom. It's no different than we got folks in America, we sitting there talking about red bones. Red bone, red bone. And it don't even mean red bone, but that's how we understood our ancestors to say it. We thought they talking about some red bone. And they literally were talking about a red or ruddy Igbo. Igbo as in the tribe. So when your mama, your great grandmama was calling your mama a, a, a red bone, it was more or less like a red Igbo. Not red bone, like a bone, a dog bone. It was red Igbo because they knew of themselves as Igbo. Because the majority of us, at least in the Americas and some places in the Caribbean, come from either Igbo or Yoruba, primarily as far as the diaspora in the Caribbean and South America and in uh, the Americas, as far as like North America. So didn't mean to go off too long, but yeah, there we go. All right. This is one of my favorite characters, pictographs, and uh, the pictograph has so much meaning to it. In modern Hebrew, it frustrated me when I was learning Hebrew. I was like, what am I doing with this word? Don't nobody know what this word is. Is it a va? Is it a wa? Is it va? What is this word? What is this thing? All right, so the er, original pictograph used in the early Semitic script is what you see right there. All right, so it looks like a Y. And guess what? Uh, this is the biblical root language for your letter Y, your letter W, your letter U, because literally a W is two U's together. Um, your letter V, man, it, it, that's why this, this particular pictograph be messing folks up all day long. 
I know y'all that have been studying Hebrew like me, y'all, man, I know y'all have got messed up off this one. You're like, what is going on? So this is an image of a tent peg. All right, tent pegs were made of wood, were shaped in a Y to prevent the rope from slipping off. All right. Now, this truly, when you look at it, it is a wav. It's not a W, it's not a V, but the best way we could do in trying to pronounce this is going to be a W sound. More like a W sound. It's not a W, but that's the best we got. Now, again, Hebrew is based off function, all right? So, peg, hook, this letter, character, pictograph is frequently used as a prefix to words to mean and. Guess what? It's a conjunction. Think of a tent peg, a wooden tent peg that you are using to conjoin two words together, to conjoin two sentences together, to conjoin two thoughts together. This is what you're gonna have at the, as a prefix to that word. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. You guys, let me know. You yes. guys, unmute yourselves. Let me know. I don't want to lose nobody. So just talk to me. Let me know. Yes. Just give me. We good? Yeah. May I yeah. ask a question? May I ask a question? Absolutely. Hi. How? Um, you stated that it was the root of the U, the V, the W. Uh, would that also include and the a Y? X? Would that also include the X, the letter X, or is mm -hmm. that a, der a derivative, derivative of another character? That's a different character. It is okay. Yeah, you. you're you're looking at your Y, your V, mm -hmm. your U, and your W. Okay. All root back to this one character. Okay, thank you. So I have a question too. Um, mm -hmm. uh, get rid of things that I found earlier that are incorrect. I have on my notes that it can also be pronounced with an O sound. Yes, depending on what's next to it. So again, that's again. So like I said, right, it's the root of a U, double U, right? It's the sound of the U, right? Mm -hmm. So U, so, okay. I can't get super nerdy on y'all because that y'all be like, okay, more <laughs> Dwayne has gone out no, there. No, no. Come on with like, it, more. Out there, out there. It, one might it, it. No, this would be real. the one letter. This is the, this is the letter though. This is the letter. This, this would be the letter. This is going to be the one. All right, so... In general, um, as a prefix to a word, it's going to be a like a way sound, like a wo. It's, it's gonna it's gonna be a wo sound. Okay, if it's in the middle of a word, it's like it's not a prefix. It's actually in the word. Then it's it's gonna be um, in like a vowel. Yes, it's gonna be like a wo a wo sound. Like for me, like if 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 I were to say um, like not Yahovah, right? I would I could say um, Yahu, Yahu. Yo, hey, so, why? So I'm saying Yahu. I'm saying Yahu. Mm. Got to hear them how I'm saying it. I'm saying Yahu. Like so, if you were to say Yahoo, we say Yahoo, Yahoo, right? Yeah. You can get away with it. No one's gonna beat you up, <laughs> okay? But it's it's you could also more authentically say "yao." It's you have to relax your mouth a little bit when the way you say "yao." So um, yeah, it's like "yawa." Mm -hmm. So it would be like if you're saying like "Jehovah." Or Yahovah, it's really like more or less Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Everything don't got to be a hard. These German folks in Ashkenaz, they, tr they got to make everything all Germanic and hard sounding and stuff like that. 
not everything's hard like that. Um, oh man, I can't go too deep into it. But anybody that studied like the Bantu languages or uh, West African languages and how they add words together, like each word by themselves might sound a certain type of way. But then when you combine those words together, it's like a brand new word. Even though you're taking word A, word B, and you're adding them together, when you put them together, they're not going to sound as individual, like so, so um, harsh with the different um, sounds. It's going to flow a little bit different. Um, but that's for a more intermediate level than this. I don't want to, I want to just give an introduction. This is like a, just understanding. So I'm going out there a little bit, but yeah, you would say, um, um, the, the wall sound is a, is a W sound. So, whoa. I feel like we do that in our, in our dialects of English too. Like if I was to say like, you know what I mean? Like right. I'm not saying all the words. Do you know what I mean? Like you yeah. don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hallelujah. We don't do that. Like, mm, that's not how we actually talk, but you know, depends on where you're from, what tribe you're repping. All right. So um, a lot of these folks, these European folks that do the studies and they dig in to try to figure out this stuff, they, they neglect Africa for some reason. Um, I actually found this image in Mali. This is a tent peg in Mali in Africa. This is your wolf. This is what it, they were referencing. That's a tent peg. That is a wooden tent peg from a Hebrew people in Mali. That's what they were referencing when they, that's what they knew. That's an actual tent peg. Whereas the Europeans speculate, we believe it was a tent peg. That literally is a tent peg. That's really in use. Like they had that on the auction block for some, you know, folks to buy and spend money on because they stole it. So you would put the, uh, you would tie it down at the base of the wav. And so because it's forked like that, it would not get loose because of the friction of that, of that, of that um, split, of that Y shape, it's not gonna fall off. It's not gonna slide off, put it that way. All right. So I've also seen some other um, West African things like that too, where it's like, a, uh, they also use that same shape as a ladder and they could climb up like in Mali, they have those two story like um, homes. They mm -hmm. also like perch it up against the wall. They have like big ones that they use as like ladders too, which is cool to see like the similarity of that too. So um, any other questions on that before we move on? We're almost done with this portion. Maury, I have a question uh, on, yep. like, I'm sorry, on the, um, the wall. Isn't, wouldn't that be similar to how in um, Acts it talks about how um, Yahusha was hung on a tree? And isn't that similar to the way he was crucified? As far as the shape, I don't know personally. I don't know. Mm. I'd be speculating. Because I've seen it like that where it's like mm -hmm. the Y shape and then in between that, that's where they hung the where the person was at yeah right i personally don't know i could out only be speculating on that one okay but that's something definitely uh, to research and look into one more well one question more mm -hmm. um so i got this nazarene version of the basora it's got a lot of stuff that we're talking about mm -hmm. and um how we normally would write it zav or waw uh, w would you say uau would be another kind of way to pronounce it similar to waw If your mind can wrap your wrap your head around that, you could possibly try to do that. I mean, it's still the same thing. I mean, um, you'd have to wrap your mind around how do I even pronounce that? They, they how do I pronounce ooh a ooh? It'd be like it sounds wow, very like like the way the example they gave, like uh, instead of da weed or David, mm -hmm. you put the ooh the u a u and it would be daud. 
So it, like you said, it kind of gives like a, either a woo or a ooh if it's between stuff. Yeah, you know? it, it depends on if it's the, the between. Like I would get, I wouldn't even mess with that. The reason why I'm saying that I wouldn't mess with that is I would rather learn it as it is. Okay. Meaning, um, hold on a second. All right. Meaning, when I actually see the character, okay, in the word, I know how it's supposed to sound. I'm not going to try to use, um, <laughs> I'm not going try to try to use Latin characters to describe the phonetic sound of the word. Like, that's why I like the scriptures, uh, Bible, because on certain words, they just put the Hebrew in it. It's like, we're not going to mess around, try to mess with this. Like, we're going to just put yod heh vav -Hey and leave it like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I rather just see it as it is and then pronounce it, then try to, because the, the, the problem you have is because uh, arrogance and pride that we have a problem with is you got folks that'll be online trolling that I want to argue in English Latin characters how to transliterate Dawid or Yahweh and they want to battle over the slave master's language how it's supposed to be written. That's foolish. And for them folks like that, I'll straight up, I got, I have uh, the, the Hebrew um, Aramaic on my phone as a, as a keyboard. I'll write out a whole message in just straight Hebrew and then be like, there you go. <laughs> if you want to play games, I'll just drop a Hebrew on you and see what you, where you at. It's like, stop trying to play games with transliterations. You know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no one way to transliterate the name. So you're going to have some folks that go Y-A-H-U-A-H for Yahuwah. That's how they want to pronounce it. You got some folks that do Y A H W A H, Yahweh. You got some folks that go Y A H U W A H, Yahuwah. Listen, all you're trying to do is transliterate, meaning the pronunciation of the words. You're just trying to transliterate them as best you can into a foreign language. Like, stop bossing up and getting swollen in the chest off of something as simple as, simple as that. Like, that's foolish. We don't got to do that. You know what I'm saying? We just don't. It's like, listen, um, what I would say is, you know, each person is going to do what's best for them to understand. But in general, I would have just simply rather know that um, when you have the wall at the beginning of a word, it's going to have a, like a, uh, a, a wah way sound on the, on the word as a prefix to the word that, that designates that you're, it's with it. It's, it's like, and, all right, that's your official and character on, on a, a front of a word is that, all right. If okay. it's, trying to like a Dawid or Dawood, there's some that do that. There's some that do say Dawood. But again, that depends on the dialect. You're still looking at the wo 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 sound, which is why you have the birth of your W, your U, and your Y. So, um, I mean, it's deep. But here you go again. You're looking at the early Semitic script. You're looking at the middle Semitic script. And then you're also looking at the late Semitic script, which was put into the Aramaic on the far right, you see right there, or the modern script. All right. Um, this also became the number nine and also came the letter F. But after it, they got rid of it later, the Greece got rid of it later.
That was a Greek thing, and then they got rid of it. They tossed it out. All right, any questions? Um, yeah, I have one. It's not pertaining to this character. It's, it's for the Olive. Like, when we say um, Elohim, should we really be saying, like, Elohim? Um, you can say Elohim, or it's it's literally uh, Olu. It's how it will be best pronounced. Okay. But if you're talking about Olu, or you're talking about, um, like, again, the singular like when Mashiach was on the on the cross or he's on the tree hanging and he said Eli Eli he didn't say Eli Eli that's how they pronounce it to say Eli Eli but he was really saying Oluwa Oluwa which is the singular of like you're saying like my Elohim my El so how they write it, they say, if you were to try to be very um, European in how to say, say it, it's more or less like, Eloi, Eloi. But it's really Oluwa, Oluwa. Lama Sabachthani. So again, the battle we have is that we're dealing with the um, anglicized, Western Eurocentric, we're dealing with that. All right, that's the that's the challenge that we have. We're dealing with the way they choose to pronunciate it. Everything is L, um, Elohim. That's the Europe. The Europeans studied that. The Europeans taught that. And then you have folks like us that are trying to regain and recapture the um, the knowledge of our history and our language. And so we repeat. We, we repeat what they're saying um, as it's the gospel truth because that's all we were taught. So the Ashkenaz folks say it this way, we say it that way. You know what I mean? The, um, you know, the, you know, British, you know, Germanic folks want to say it a certain type of way based off their tongue. Again, British and Germanic, right? They're going to say it the way they say it. They're going to teach it the way they teach it. And so you got a bunch of copycats that just imitate what they've already said. But now you have it where you do have the Bantu languages being man made manifest. You have um, um, a lot of us, that, you know, from um, from the uh, Igbo or the Bamon in Cameroon. You have Bamaliki. You have the Yoruba. You have the Ghanaians from you know, the, the Tui language. Um, you have all these different Bantu speaking peoples, Bantu, nigger, Congo speaking peoples that are going, wait a minute, we use that same word, but we don't say it like that. We say it like this. Or we have that exact same words, but we say it backwards. Meaning over time, the prefix became the suffix or the suffix became the prefix. So um, with the awakening of the Israelites, 12 tribes worldwide waking up, instead of bossing up on each other, like we got it all sewed up and we got the original, which is stupid. We should be looking at it from the standpoint properly, like, listen, let's connect with one another. Let me get my, you know, Kikongo and you get your Baluba and you get your um, Kikuyu and you get your limba, and you get your uh, your um, your um, your ibo, and your yoruba, and your tree, and let's all come together to find the similarities in the script and the words, and go from there. That's what we should be doing instead of trying to boss up on each other like we got, we the latest and greatest, and we got it all figured out. We're we the only ones. We're not the only ones. We have each other. We have to embrace each other. Um, Man, that's that's a whole different topic of conversation. But um, all right. Anybody else have any um, have any questions? Real quick, have you ever heard the wah? I have another note saying that it's short. Though. 
have you ever heard associated with the short O? Something happened with your mic. Say again. Um, have you ever heard the Y associated with the short O? Give me an example of a short O. Uh, like O instead of O. Like, is that where people get Yehoshua? Um, see, it's it's no, it's more like a wool. Okay. Oh, like a woe as opposed to an O. Okay. Right. Again, the when you're doing your studies and you, li and you listen to these white folks, I'm just keep it simple. These Europeans, let's keep it proper. They're taking their it's their culture. Get out their culture. Like you can you could you can start from there because that's where you at. Okay. But don't stay there. Um we gotta keep it tight. We gotta keep it tight to to the biblical root to um a more african root okay instead of a germanic or english or turkic root because that was messes up they're they're still trying to transliterate it into their tongue there is just another variation of trying to translate it into their tongue so instead of it being like yaoshua type of thing it's Wuxia. Okay. And you're like, well, I didn't understand that. I know because you have an English mindset. Your mind is not adjusted to that tongue yet. Not everything is so hard, but in English, it has to be hard. You know how they talk all proper and they have to do it a certain type of way. It's not always like that in, in, the, in the Hebrew like that. So if you were to try to do a hybrid, you would more properly say Yahushua. Yahushua Hamashiach. Yahushua. I'm not saying Yahushua or Yahushua or Yahoshua. It's Yahushua. Which is why you have them say Joshua. That's why they came up with Joshua. That's the best they could come up with when it came to Yoshua. It sounds like Joshua to me. So we're going to say Joshua. But then also, again, dialect, Northern Kingdom or Southern Kingdom, they may say Saya. And then you got them saying, well, for that type of dialect, we'll say Isaiah. So depending on dialect, someone might say Is, E, Is, or yeah. Depends on how they want to do it. Because again, the Aleph in some dialects is supposed to be silent. So why are we why are we putting a uh on there? Although we can do it on certain words under certain circumstances, it might just be Isaiah. So, but again, we're just talking about just general understanding for right now. We're not trying to get super deep. We'll get super deep later on. That's not the, to be a take up the whole time for the um, Shabbat fellowship. I just wanted to make sure that I do at least three characters a Shabbat to help us until we get through all the 22 um, and then some, and then we can go from there. So with that being said, was this helpful? And did you guys have any other questions about any of, uh, you know, Aleph, Bet, Gam, or the Dao, or the Waf, or the He? Are these in uh, alphabetical order? Yes, if you were to say, if you use that term, yes, it would be. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been helpful, very helpful. Very much so, Maureen. Thank you. Very helpful. All right, those of you that are confused, go ahead and unmute yourself and just say, I'm confused. If you're confused, because I want to put something together for those that might be just confused, something more basic. Um, if you are confused or, you know, need a little bit more help, with it, just go ahead and let me know. I can't see you, I don't have the chat up, so just let me know. You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you are, um, would like additional help. All right, we're all good? All right, yeah. Let me go ahead and stop the share.
Why am I not being seen yet? Can you guys see me? Yep. Yes, we okay. can. Yes. I'm like, what's going on with this thing? <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. All right, now I can see the, uh, I can see the comments in there. All right, so yeah, if, um, if any of you do have any questions and need some additional help on the Olive Bait, just go ahead and put a message in the comment. I will read it later and we'll go from there. All right, so um, I'll try to speed things up a little bit. I do appreciate, appreciate your time. Um, a couple of things I wanna talk about in the dress. Number one, um, leading up to the Shabbat, I've been um, processing through what's been going on. This is, you know, Passover week, unleavened bread situation has been a, a blessing. Um, in light of that, I see the things that are happening to our people across the earth, and it's really bothering me. Um, and something that our Koti uh, Mayala had said last week resonated within me throughout this entire week. And I was just been thinking about that. And that was in regards to, you know, Shalom. Yet, I believe, as it was relayed, um, prepare for battle. And ready your sword. Is that pretty accurate, Mayala? Yes, it still? is. All yes, right. it is. Can you relay that again? Can you relay that you, that you got from the Most High last week? Can you restate that? Yes, again? it was during when uh, when you were asking us for like the two minutes of just stop and listen and and hear what Yah has to say. And during that time, like I said, he put on my he spoke to me and said, you know, peace, shalom, and rest. Afterwards, prepare for the battle and ready your sword. So that's what he had spoken to me um, last Shabbat. Just letting me know that, you know, yeah, we're going to be at peace, but we got to be ready to war. So um, that's been on my heart all week long. And as I've been preparing for this lesson and, and praying and, and different things, um, that's been I've been meditating on that pretty heavily. Now, the, the issue is that So twofold. Right now, you see that the world is seeking to turn against the Israelites. They're ramping up, they're escalating right now. Um, we've been used to kind of sitting on the sidelines and looking and seeing what's happening, right, uh, in the world. And okay, this happened, that happened. Maybe a young sister got beat up, you know, doing her job. European man came up and wanted to, you know, homeless and crazy, want to snatch her up and beat her up. And all the brothers are sitting there watching her get manhandled. She got to fight for herself. You got stuff like that happening. You got police brutality, be, you know, beating the young people down, young, young people, old people, you know, body slamming pregnant women. You see all kinds of crazy things going on um, in, the, in the earth. Um, I'm seeing something that I never, ever, ever, ever would have thought I'd ever see ever and that is um our people mainly i should say our cousins hebrew israelites getting drug out like animals in china i saw a video of a brother that was basically tied up with his hands behind his back and on like a pallet or some type of something and getting drugged out of a store into the middle of the street. You got a little, you got Chinese people dragging Hebrews out. You got them kicking them out the home, kicking them out the apartment complexes, kicking them out the hotels. They can't go into the store. They can't go in to eat. They can't, they can't go to the grocery store. They can't go to restaurants. They can't even really even go to the hospital. Okay. 
Um, what I will tell right now to my international audience is that as a Hebrew Israelite, whether you know you are or not, as a, as a black African man, a black African woman, as a black person, leave these folks alone, all these folks alone. Leave them alone. Leave them alone, leave them alone. We have transitioned to a new era, a, a new light lesson. Leave these folks alone. You're gonna have to go and deal with your own house. If you got issues back in your own country, you gotta go back home and deal with your issues in your own country. You out there in these streets with these, these folks, they gonna drag you out. You have no protection. You have no covering. You have no sympathy. And I know how it is on the continent when you have these other Hebrews doing the most to you and brutalizing you and oppressing. I, I understand, but you better off dealing at home than you are out there in Asia or out there in Europe or even South America, even America, like, listen, go home. Don't go to these Arab countries. Don't go to these Arab countries. Don't leave, leave these folks alone. Because right now, these folks are getting emboldened. And because there's no regard for the Israelite, they literally are darn near next to lynching. The next thing you gonna know, they're gonna be just straight killing folks. Right now, they're strong arming our people. Okay, but when I'm seeing them drag our people out, when I see it, when I'm seeing them with butcher knives in their hands, chasing after people on the streets, um, it's not going to be much longer before we as a people are going to have to fight and defend ourselves. I just keeping it simple. Um, so that's why the message that Mayala had uh, brought forth from last week resonates with me, even to this day. And I'm going to put something together in regards to what I'm seeing. Um, because it's essentially there's, there's trouble within, there's trouble without. And we have to um, band together. Like, we, listen, um, you, we have to be about our brother and our sister. Like, you, you have to be your brother or your sister's keeper. You have to look out for your brother and your sister and they kids, okay? The, the, the times of turning a blind eye because it doesn't affect me, it's not my business, is over with. We as a people, if I see my sister or my grandmother out here in these streets getting accosted, I need to go and get with her. I need to protect her, all right? I just, I, I, I don't wanna get too, too, too deep into it um we'll get into that later but really it's one of those things where um in the most high we need solutions as a body as a people we need to start thinking about solutions um because we cannot rely on the world systems to sustain us because when your job is gone and everything is controlled by the nation. They don't like you like us in the first place. What are you gonna do? You gonna be in the, in the food line waiting for, some, for a handout from the government to feed you, to clothe you, to tell you what job you can have and where you can go and how you should live? Like uh, the 400 years is up, judgment is coming upon these nations. Um, you see them cranking out fake checks. You know, they passed, what, almost a half a trillion dollar stimulus package. All right. But yet, a few months ago, they're like, yeah, we'll look into reparations with y'all Negroes. But when it comes to the pressing from the most high and the situation is going on out of control, now all of a sudden they got, they can, they can pull some money out of nowhere. They're going to have to give account for how they're treating us. Uh, but in light of that is something where we have to have a focus and a mindset on each other that you're not just some random black person on the street. You're my sister. You're my brother. Your children are not just some random black kids playing in the neighborhood. Those are my children too. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so 
we'll get into that later. I want to press on to get into our main lesson for time's sake. Um, that all being said, in my prayer time, what the Most High has been revealing to me is that we have to take this time of unleavening seriously. Okay, so I'm talking to y'all, all 35 of y'all in the in or 30 of y'all in the uh, the group right now. I'm talking to y'all, each and every one of y'all, the houses you re you represent. All right, if you have secret sin you need to deal with it if you have secret sin you need to deal with it and this goes to those that will listen to this later on if you have secret sin in your life now is not the time to play we are we are in overtime right now and we in the ninth inning we're about to wrap this thing up like you have to get your heart right, period. So I got some scripts we're going to go over. I'm going to ask for some readers so it's not too redundant. So, um, and also, um, even if we can't see your face, but you are on the call, I would like for you to participate. So you have the ability, if you want to help read, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and participate um, in, the, in the lesson. So what I want to do right now I want us to read Ezekiel chapter 18. Okay. Now, um, can I get a reader from verse 1 through verse 13? I need a reader from. I'll read it. All right, go ahead. I'm going to read it out of the King James. You said Ezekiel 18? Yes, please. Right. <clears throat> it says, The word of the Most High came unto me again, saying, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, say the Most High, you shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father also, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right and has not eaten upon the mountains, neither has lifted up his head, his eyes, to the idols of the house of Israel, neither has defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has come near to a mentor's woman, and has not oppressed any, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has spoiled none by violence, has given his bread to the hungry, and has covered the naked with a garment. He that has not given forth upon usury, neither has taken any increase that has withdrawn his hand from iniquity, has executed true judgment between men and men, has walked in my statutes and has dealt and has kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just and he shall surely live, saith the Most High. All right, stop if right he, there. Stop right there for a second. All right, so right now the Most High is making a distinction. He's breaking it down. He's talking about a just man that does these things, right? He's first off saying in verse four, behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so the soul of the son is mine or the soul of the daughter. All right, and he breaks down the acts of a righteous person all the way down to verse nine. He walk, or hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly he is just, he surely, he shall surely live, saith the Most High Yah. All right. Now go ahead again, verse 10 through 13. Finish that out. If he begot a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that does and doeth the like to any one of these things, 
in that doeth not any of these of those duties, but even has eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife, has oppressed the poor and needy, has spoiled by violence, has not restored the pledge, and has lifted up his eyes to idols, have committed abominations, has given forth upon usury, and has taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Stop right there. All right. So we just got finished breaking down a righteous man. This is a righteous man that's doing these righteous works, these righteous actions that are a fruit bearing from his life. But verse 10 breaks down and says, if he beget a son that's a robber, a shedder of blood that doeth the like any of these things, that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, that deals with sacrifices, that deals with dealing with other idols, dealing with little E Elohims, right? Defiling his neighbor's wife. This is someone that is a seducer of women, married women, a rapist. Has oppressed the poor and needy, has spoiled by violence, has not restored the pledge, meaning you take a pledge from somebody and then you don't even return it back. You keep it. Lifting your eyes up to idols. Down verse 13, have given forth upon usury. Do y'all know that as Israelites, if I lend you some money, I'm not to be lending you some money with interest. If I lend you $500, you owe me $500 in due season. You, I don't care if it, if it takes you 10 years to pay that $500 back. That's not how that works. You just owe $500. Or let's just say literally seven years, right? Let's say it takes you six and a half years to pay that $500 back, right? You just owe me that $500. I'm not going to sit there where well, you owe me interest at 10%, 20%, 30% interest. These are abominations of the Most High, High's eyes. But uh, in the Torah, it doesn't just speak that you can use like usury to like other nations. Yes. But we're not talking about other nations though. But yes, in regards to other nations, if you're doing business or work or dealings with other nations, you can uh, charge increase or a tax in regards to those transactions. But amongst your people, that's what I'm saying. Amongst Hebrews, amongst Israelites, you're not supposed to be doing that. That's against Torah to be charging interest against your brother or your sister. Okay. All right, so now verse 14. Now, lo, if he beget a son that sees all his father's sins, which he has done and considers and doeth not such like him that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up the eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any that hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and has covered the naked with a garment that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed by judgments, hath walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother, by violence and did that which is not good amongst his people. Lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. What you have happening right now is a breakdown. You have a father, a son, and a grandson. A righteous father, a wicked son, a righteous grandson. And the point being made is that that grandson is not going to bear the iniquity of the father. And likewise, the wicked man cannot roll on by the righteousness of their father. Don't nobody care that your father or your mother is righteous, but you wicked. If you wicked, you wicked. You're going to give account for your own sins. You can't ride on the coattails of your mother and father in their righteousness, and you wicked. You're going to get cut off. In the same way, 
if there's a son that is righteous, even though his father is wicked, depending, right? You're going to have a situation where he's still not going to die in unrighteousness. He's going to die in his righteousness. That righteous grandson, that third generation, even in his own death, will die righteously, a righteous man. So, you go down to verse 19. Yet you say, why? Why? Does not the son bear the iniquity of the father when the son has done that which is lawful and right and hath kept all my statutes and hath done them? He shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. But the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But now we're going to get into the meat of this thing. Let me get a reader. Let me get a reader for verse 21. 21 through 24. A nice, strong leader. Someone that I have not read before. I'll read. Go ahead. Verse, <clears throat> verse 21. The wicked, if he turns from all his sin, which he has done, and he shall guard all my laws, and shall do right rulings and righteousness, he shall certainly live, he shall not die. All the transgressions which he has done shall not be remembered against him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Adon Yahuwah? Is it not that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous one turns away, his righteousness and does unrighteousness according to all the abominations that the wicked one has done shall he live all his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered for his trespass which he has committed and for his sin which he has committed for them he shall die read verse 24 one more time please i need us all to listen and pay attention to that one more time but when a righteous one turns away from his righteousness and does unrighteousness according to all the abominations that the wicked one has done, shall he live? All his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. For his trespass, which he has committed, and for his sin, which he has committed, for them he shall die. All right, so again, I, I want to hit that home. You have to understand, coming out of Christianity, coming out of any denominational, non-denominational background, one thing that was often stated was a kind of a once saved, always saved type situation. All right, what you have to understand in light of uh, the Brit Hadashah and Mashiach coming and doing what he did to redeem us and restore us back to the Father, you have to understand that the Most High is not playing. It doesn't matter about your past righteousness. Verse 24, but when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. It shall not be brought back into remembrance. Because in your current state, your current mindset, you are in the heart of wickedness. You've turned away from your righteousness towards wickedness. And I'm telling you right now, each and every one of us needs to examine our hearts to make sure we are not operating in any type of iniquity that would lead us astray because you're not going to go and say, well, I set up so many assemblies or I preached or taught so many different messages or I taught the children or I did so many videos talking about your name and who you are and how great you are, Most High Elohim. Don't nobody care about all that when the reality of the matter is you're beating your wife at home. You're laying your hands in harshness against your children at home. 
you're physically abusing your family. You're sexually assaulting your wife. Or sexually assaulting your husband. It happens. You mistreat your brother and your sister. You out there committing adultery against your wife. You out there committing adultery against your husband. You got side pieces out there in the streets. You have idols set up in your heart. You got a whole pornography collection in the back room or on the computer or or, or y'all forbid somebody get into your phone. You have to examine your heart, dig deep and bring forth those things that are inside that you are secretly dealing with and bring them to the forefront because it's not about me. It's not about your brother to the left or to the right. None of that. The most high sees everything, knows everything. We're in a season where we cannot play with this thing. Many of us are dealing with secret sin. Stuff that nobody knows about. Nobody has a clue. You may have idols in your house. You may not have idols in your house, but you have idols in your heart. There's things that draw you away from the presence of the Most High Yah. There's some of us that struggle with the drink. So we got the drink drink in the back, calling our name. Some of us are dealing and struggling with lust the lust of the eyes. You may not be acting out on the lust of your heart, yet you're still acting out the lust in your mind when you're looking at that man that way, when you're looking at that woman that way. We have to make sure that we tighten things up within ourselves because the Most High is looking at using us and doing some great and mighty things in the near future, but he's not gonna be able to do them if your heart's not ready. If your heart's not ready. Straight up, you have to prepare your heart It makes me sad when I think that there's many people that aren't going to make it because they could not give up the idols in their heart. Let me get a reader for uh, verse 25. Verse 25 I'll and 31, please. 25 to 31. Go ahead. Um, you know, I'm oh, here, right here. I'm sorry, I lost my glasses for a second. Here. No problem, there's no rush. All right, um, 35, I'm sorry. 20, 25 through okay. 30. Thank you. One. 25 to 31. Thank you. Yet ye have said, the way of the Lord is not straight. Hear now, all of the house of Israel, will not my way be straight? Is your way straight? When the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits a trespass, and dies in the trespass which he has committed, he shall even die in it. And when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and shall do judgment and justice, he has kept his soul. He has turned away from all his ungodliness which he has committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel say, the way of the Lord is not right. Is not my way right, O house of Israel? Is not your way wrong? I will judge you, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, 
each one according to his way. Be converted and turn from all your ungodliness, and it shall not become to you the punishment of iniquity. Cast away from yourselves all your ungodliness, wherein ye have sinned against me, and make to yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should I should ye die, O house of Israel? For I desire Thank you. not... Oh, I'm 31. Sorry. That's that's it. So I'm going to start back at 28, and I'm going to go back down in 31. And I'm going to go out of the King James, because um, it brings some things out, little intricacies that you should look and be aware of. And thank you very much for that reading. That was powerful. Because he considers and turns away from all his transgressions that he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Key words being considering, thinking, dwelling, meditating on himself, his actions, herself, her actions, and turns away from all those transgressions that he's or she has committed, he or she shall surely live and shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of Yah is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, saith Yahuwah Elohim. Repent. And turn yourselves from all transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have, now I'm on the verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith Yahuwah Elohim. Wherefore, turn yourselves Repent and live. In this time of unleavening, this is where we need to be. Because before the Most High is going to be able to use you the way that he wants to use you, you have to get rid of the leaven in your heart. You got to get it all out, all of it. You can't have a little bit left in some tiny crack crevice someplace. Um, I will tell you my own personal testimony. And then we're going to transition to some more scriptures. And then I'm going to open it up for conversation. All right. And then we're going to get into the next portion of our lesson. All right. My own personal testimony. I used to struggle heavily with pornography back in the day. The Most High spoke a word to me. He said, I cannot take you where I needed to take you with this in your life. I repeat, the most I told me, <clears throat> straight up, I cannot take you where I need to take you with this in your life. So I got rid of any type of VHS tapes I had. I got rid of any type of DVDs I had. I got rid of any type of online uh, uh, hard drive collections I had stored up. Deleted all that stuff. Okay. Um, I, w I, I destroyed everything. Okay. And I destroyed it so that someone else couldn't go from behind me to take my trash and take it home with them. I literally destroyed it so that it could not be used by anyone else. A couple weeks went by. A couple months goes by. Most high's like, that's not it. You didn't get it all. I'm thinking, I got rid of everything. Everything I could think of. Two things. The screensaver on your computer has all these half-naked girls on there in bikinis and skippy outfits. Got to go. Wow. Okay. Got rid of that. Didn't even think about that. Think I'm good. A couple weeks goes by. Uh, 
there's still something left. I'm like, what is it? I'm searching my house left and up and down, left and right. Under my bed and some back corner cut against the wall were some Maxim magazines. So those of you, I don't even know they, they're even still around nowadays, but back in the, in the days, in the 90s and the early 2000s, they had a Maxim magazine and a For Him magazine and Black Men something. And it was a bunch of basically beautiful half-naked women in the magazine on the covers and then throughout the thing. And it was basically soft porn, essentially. Just beautiful women, actresses and models and skimpy outfits. And it was still the, the seduction of lust and, and fornication type thing going on. That's the idea. Um, I found that I'm like, man, I didn't even, I didn't even think, of, I, didn't, I didn't know. I had to grab that and roll it and grab, I had to search and scour for any type of magazines like that and I got rid of them. You know what I'm saying? But that's the type of situation for my own personal testimony in regards to the Most High speaking to me. I'm just saying, speaking to me, saying, I am not going to be able to take you where I need to take you with these things in your life. When you have the idol of lust and fornication and orgasm and eargasm in your life, because you have set that up as an idol, that instead of coming to me with your insecurities, with your loneliness, with your pain, with your frustration, you turn to these things. And I'm trying to handle the most high's business. I'm like, you taking me somewhere. I don't know where you're trying to take me to, but I'm sure it's going to be good. So I want to be obedient. And being honest, if not like I was perfect, there's times when I backslid, like most of y'all backslid. There's times when I backslid. But even in your backsliding, you got to straight up, get back up, repent. What do I always talk about? Spiritual maturity, right? Spiritual maturity and intellectual honesty. I'm always talking about that, right? Those of you that go to my assemblies, got to keep it real. If and or when you fall, you better get up, repent, and turn away quick and really dig deep into your heart to figure out what you got to do to break the cycle of idolatry in your heart. Because I'm telling you right now, the Most High is about to do a major work in our, in our lifetime and do things that we would have never imagined or even possible due to our previous circumstances of 400 years of bondage and slavery. He's going to turn things around like that. But you have to be ready. So you have to ask yourself right now in your heart, in your heart right now, Am I truly ready? If I had to give account for my life right now, if, if you got the most high, open up, let's talk. Are you going to be ready for that conversation? Are you going to be in a place where the most high can use you? Um, I'm going to open it up for dialogue and discussion very briefly based on what we talked about so far. And then I have some more scriptures to go through, but I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to go ahead and open it up right now. So if you have anything you want to say in regards to the topic of conversation specifically, again, in regards to this topic of conversation specifically, go ahead and unmute yourself and jump right in with uh, your input. Hey, Morey. Uh, this is Ock Mack out here in Portland. Man, I appreciate your transparency. And, and, and I'm, I'm just loving where you're going with this, man. I mean, it's so huge. If we can be transparent with ourselves and just walk up right before the Most High, man, people are going to see that light. The world going to see that light, you know. And like you were saying, this week of unleavening, man, I tell you, it's been so huge. And I know probably before all the rest of the assemblies, if this thing is so huge for us because right now the Most High – just show me, even when you were talking, it's about the, the 10 virgins, the five that were wise and five that were few foolish. And I know you can go in deep on this, but I see this is where we're at right now because he's coming for us. But we got to be ready to, to meet him in righteousness because nothing, 
that's not righteous is going to stand. It's going to be burnt up. We got to make sure our works are going to be able to, you know, withstand the fire. And, 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 and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. We got to be righteous. The last uh, uh, message that came to me was be holy for I am holy. This is our duty. So, more, I'm loving where you're going. I'm loving where you're taking all the assemblies, man. And I tell you, I'm praying for you that the Most High will strengthen you and give you everything you need to take us into the glory and to the kingdom. Because I believe this is it. This is it. So, I'm going to digress and get on here and just let y'all, rest of y'all, have a word. Amen. Appreciate that. Anybody else jump right in? I'd like to say, uh, I've been praying to the Most High, asking him to reveal to me anything that I'm missing because I have been searching and coming up empty and knowing that I'm human, I know that I sin. And so I would like to ask the family to pray for me um, in regards to that, that he does reveal to me whatever it is that I need to look at within myself. So that I can come to grips with it, acknowledge it, and truly, really repent before Him, because I do not. My fear is that I miss something, and then I get miss. I miss out on in, being able to enter the kingdom or be able to to do the work for the Most High. Uh, the only thing that He did reveal to me was, I don't know if this is silly or not, but He did reveal that. You know, when I'm at work or I'm working with coworkers, you know, you, you kind of jest a little bit and you may say things that you shouldn't say. And a lot of times, because we get calls from people, it can be taxing and you might make a joke about it or you'd be like, oh my gosh, please pray for me. Well, I mostly work with Gentiles. And sometimes I find myself, I, I will say that and I realize in this walk now, I can't be asking them to pray for me because their God is not my God. So right. that was that was the only thing that, that came to me. But if you guys could please pray for me to, to have him reveal anything else. Yeah, I definitely will do that. I'll, I'll um, close this out in prayer. We'll, we'll do prayer requests on that one um, for all of you that want to pray. Um, anyone else? Jump right in. Shalom, shalom. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Brother Eliyah, Um, I just I just want to say some encouraging words to everybody. Just to this is the time, like like I, like Moray was saying, this the most high is the plan. You read the script, the the examples are there. you know, the people that transgressed, they they put their death. You know what I'm saying? This is the matter of life and death. Your soul, your salvation is is at hand right now. You know, we got to be repenting every day, daily repenting, checking yourself in the mirror, you know, and not pointing the finger at someone else, but, but checking your own stuff. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and just really asking the most high in this time to show you um, what it is that, that you have in you that you've been holding on to for years. You might not even know about it. It might be something from, uh, from high school or from back in the day or something. So you, you want to you wanna ask the most high today. Ayok, hey, you're breaking up real, real bad. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I got the gist of what you're saying. Um, we'll have to figure something out. Sadly, I know I, where, my, where my brother lives at. It's like a, a brick wall fortress. So, yeah, he has a tough time. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> He's still yeah, it's not that you got inside you that you don't even know you got, you know, just to ask him that. That he reveal it to you. This thing. So, that's, that's crazy. Hear me? <laughs> hey man, you done, man? <laughs> your your stuff is done. Uh, um, 
I have a question um, in Go regards ahead. to like, like, repentance and everything. Um, I know we're during this process of unleavening, we're trying to get all the little pieces everywhere, you guys hear me? From all the little cracks and corners and stuff. But do you truly get everything? I know we, like, how do we know? I know we pray and we ask the most how to reveal where things are, but in our lifetime, but is it is it like fully possible? I guess <laughs> so. So it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, so the the issue comes down to this: is that um, we did a lesson a couple weeks back. I might have to show you guys it um, previously, but we talked. We went over uh, Second Esdras. And then within Second Esdras, he talks about, he goes before the Most High in humbleness and contrite spirit. Uh -huh. He goes to the Most High and he breaks down how he's a, he counts himself amongst the unrighteous. And the Most High actually rebukes him and says, do not, you keep saying this thing, don't keep counting yourself amongst the unrighteous. You have to understand something. A truly unrighteous person does not care that they're unrighteous. Mm. A truly unrighteous person doesn't care about the most high, doesn't care about self-reflecting, doesn't care about going before the most high in humbleness and contrite spirit to say, most high, forgive me. I know I'm in need of your mercy. I know I'm in need of your grace. I'd see these areas in my life where I missed the mark, where I've struggled in these areas. Not that you keep struggling in those areas, but that you've struggled in those areas, whether it be with your tongue, whether it be in how you um, handle your wife or handle, you know, your husband or handle your children, you know what I mean? Or handle your brother and sister. Some of us treat complete strangers and Gentiles better than we do our own blood brothers and sisters or our own people. Some of us will sit there and shuck and jive for these other folks and not even be, um, you know what I'm saying? We're not even trying to, to be there for our own. Which leads to situations where you have that, that young sister that was working at McDonald's getting beat up by the, by the bum. And you got a grown Negro standing there looking like his arm is broke while his sister's getting, getting manhandled to the point where she had to fight for her life. That's not handling your brother, your sister properly. We've gotten into a, a era of self-centeredness. So when you look at what Esdras did, Ezra or Esdras did in going before the Most High, a righteous person goes before the Most High and self-reflects on their life, does these things literally does those things of what considereth his ways and turns from all transgressions. The fact that you have a heart to seek after the most high is your righteousness. Because again, if you, if you and I don't want to get too deep into this right now, but if you look into it, you look into either your own life or the life of others you've seen around. When they start dabbling in sin, what ends up happening? They feel like I can't approach the light of the Most High Yah. I can't go to church. I can't be around righteous folks or folks that appear righteous. I don't want to talk about God. I don't want to, don't, talk, don't bring that Bible over here. Nothing. Because their sin draws them away from the righteousness of the most high their sin draws them away from being able to get it right with the most high they are not even comfortable approaching the light to even ask for mercy to even ask for forgiveness to highlight the darkness within and say i'm dealing with this i'm struggling with this my wife cries at night because of the way i treat her My children cry at night because of the way I treat their, their mother or treat their father. Or when I walk into the room, my children are scared of me. There's something wrong on the inside. I have an anger problem. 
or I got a drinky drink problem. Or I got a weed problem. Or I'm, I'm, I'm sipping on that lean. And it's changing who I am. I'm over here, got side pieces in the street. And then wondering why my life is upside down. You know, I got some stories, y'all. I can't, I can't even go into it right now. I want to keep things flowing. But anybody else have anything they want to bring out? Hey, Maury. Um, during this period, like I said, this is you know the unleavened bread, and we're supposed to be looking into and searching and asking Yah to reveal. And you know, with my job, um, I'm a supervisor, and I have to deal with a lot of disciplinary issues. And then one thing um, Abaya showed me is that when I, I get irritated, I get frustrated, I get angry, having to deal with grown people and then having to discipline. Mm -hmm. And so the scripture where the archangel Michael didn't rail against Hasatan um, for Moshe's, what, what they did when he was fighting over Moshe's body. Mm -hmm. So Yah has been showing me that scripture and talking to me that I need to not rail on my job um, when my frustration come with dealing with people that I have to constantly discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's something that he has showed me. So I'm working on that with him and I praise you for that. And hopefully he'll continue to show me other areas in my life that I need to get the leaven out, that old leaven. So. And man, I mean, yeah, it's again, um, very good questions and very good statements. Again, when it comes to your, your life and the leaven inside, the most high is going to reveal those things to you that need to be dealt with right now. The most high takes us through a process in life to test our faith, develop our faith and bring us into a process to becoming meaning you're in the process of becoming who you already are. It's a maturing process. You know what I'm saying? Um, a, a blackberry is a blackberry. Regardless of what stage it's in, seed form or fully ripened, you're in the process of becoming. And so your goal is to make sure that you continue the process of becoming until you reach ripeness, until you reach the fullness of who you've been meant to be. And what you don't want to do is stagnate yourself with the cares of this world. And then therefore you don't make it. You don't make it to fullness. Your, your life gets up getting cut off short because of the wickedness that you've allowed to take root in your life, to take root in your heart. Because when, the alarm was going off in your mind in regards to A, check yourself, deal with this issue. And you said, nah, I don't want to do that. That's a problem. Right. All right, anybody else before we move on? Jump right in. I just want to thank you <clears throat> for speaking on this and bringing it up and bringing it out. It's a lot of confirmation for things that the father's been speaking to me lately. So I appreciate you speaking about this, man. Um, he told me I was looking for things that were like open sins or that were obvious sins or things that are apparent. <clears throat> but he told me also, not, don't just look for those things. Clean yourself up. Clean your house up. Don't just look for the obvious things like, oh, I'm not hitting, I'm not chasing skirt and all that. Mm -hmm remove the leaven from my house and then clean myself up and clean this house up and keep it that way is what I hear him speaking along with what you just confirmed for me. So thank you. Amen. So, all right. I, go ahead. Um, whoever that was. Um, shalom everyone. Shabbat shalom. Yeah, um, we haven't had a chance to talk, Moray. This is Lelisa. Um, we keep missing each other. 
But my biggest downfall and um, one of my biggest downfall has been a, a process of doubt and the enemy using my faith, Ooh. which is as strong as it is, it's still a weakness and he's used that against me. So now I'm hearing the most high is like, it's okay for me to learn from other people, but I keep hearing, you know, study to show yourself approved to me. So it's like the last few weeks, it's like, okay, I've had this strong desire, like, okay, it's time for me to get my C for it. It's time for me to get my, my books. It's time for me to sit down and bust this word to the point where I learn the Hebrew and I can understand it for myself. Mm -hmm. Not so much of everybody else teach me, but literally learning it for myself. I know he has a place that he wants to take me, but I've allowed so much doubt because it's not so much on myself it's other people that's been in my life mm -hmm. to throw that from family to my mom to just individuals that were just friends totally and these have been some friends that's been in the faith been in the truth mm -hmm. so um it was so funny I think it was about a, two weeks ago was it that you called me on it when we were talking you was like I heard the doubt in you and mm -hmm. it, it's in there and I, I that's what Yah has been really dealing with me on because he I love him dearly he knows I love him but mm -hmm. it's the fact that I've allowed other voices other people to come in and throw that doubt on different things that he's Man. given to me and presented to me he's presented certain things that he's wanted me to do and because I've heard other people bring that doubt I've sat back in the cut and I've allowed these things to go past me and now it's like now you're down at the wire and I need you to start doing what you're supposed to do, but you have to get past this doubt. So this, this whole lesson, and I've missed a lot of classes and missed prayer, but I'm thankful to you, Moray, that you reached out to me because it was like, I think it was less than a couple of hours that you reached out to me when I put in the chat in Rebirth that I wanted to know more about Arizona because I'm in Las Vegas basically by myself and Moray literally reached out to me within hours <laughs> it was like here come you know worship so yeah my biggest thing is doubt and I've had to really deal with myself on that and that's a sin within itself and a lot of us do not realize that our faith as much as we can say oh I got faith I know y'all is gonna take care of us oh y'all got me hallelujah yo faith can be piece 11 that you don't even really know that you have you can have just a little ounce of faith that will go the opposite direction and that can just mess you up totally I've been there I'm still dealing with it so I just I ask for everybody to just keep me up in prayer because that is something I'm daily struggling with struggling daily pushing and pulling it I literally can hear Hasatan sometimes come in and I'll be real cool and then here he comes with that little bit. And he, it's not always him. He'll use somebody else to throw something like dagger. So it's, it's hard and it's still hard for me. So I do ask everybody just keep me up in prayer because it's, I'm struggling with some things on this end. I got you. So what she had just mentioned is, is extremely powerful. Um, what you have to understand is that your faith is a weapon. And your faith is a weapon that could be used like a double-edged sword for your benefit or your destruction. Now, the way that Hasatan works is like this. All he got to do is sprinkle a little doubt on your mind to get you to take the bait to start meditating on the possibility of doubt. You ever look at some, some of these, uh, these uh, court trials and all the defense has to do is cast doubt against the arguments. And that could be enough to acquit someone solely based off of conjecture and doubt. Well, did he really do it? I don't know. Well, maybe you're right. See, when it comes to your faith, 
and you're believing and standing in agreement in prayer on something. This is why it's so important that you understand about prayer. And I really will end up doing an actual, a full blown lesson on prayer because that's something that's so extremely important. Like probably one of the next few lessons I'll do will be on, on prayer. Because what it comes down to is if you do not pray in faith, you will destroy yourself. You will have defeat after defeat after defeat. You have to pray in faith and not in fear slash doubt. Regardless of what your immediate manifested circumstance looks like or even is in reality, what you're believing for by faith and you're praying for by faith has to be in faith without waver, without doubt. Small example, and then I'm going to go to some scriptures. I'm going to have uh, some of you guys uh, go to some scriptures to kind of hone in on this. Um, for instance, in this time in this season where people are losing their job and there's layoffs that are happening, by faith, you should pray something along the lines of, Abba Yah, I thank you now here in advance for the provision you provide for me and my household. I thank you that you have, you allow me to have this job to sustain myself. I, I thank you for keeping me and keeping my mind at sh in Shalom during this time and during this season. I stand in agreement with all the manifold blessings you have for my life, the provisions you have for my life. And again, I thank you for my job. I thank you for my employment. In the name of Yeshua, I'm Shiak, amen. What would not be a prayer of faith would be, Father God, I just, uh, I thank you right now for who you are. For, for your manifold blessings on my life, you know, and Abba Yah, I just pray I don't lose my job. I, I just pray I don't get fired on Friday. I pray that they, they you know, they let me uh, stay on the job and do my work because I don't want to get fired, y'all. I don't want to get fired, y'all. <laughs> yeah, that ain't a, that's not a prayer of faith, y'all. Because you're praying and you can thank the most high all you want to, but the root of what's in your heart is lose my job, get fired, lose my job, lose my employment. That's the focus of your prayer. When, when it comes to your faith, you're not proclaiming, professing what you want. You are meditating on what you don't want. Therefore, don't be surprised when Friday comes and you lost your job. Because literally, in your prayer, the energy of the heart, the energy of faith, the creative force of your faith was focused on what you don't want. I don't want to, what you don't want, lose my job. Your, the energy, the emotional energy you're putting out, if not the emotional energy of breakthrough, the emotional energy of, Father, I thank you for my job. I thank you for my employment. And I thank you that even during the season and this time frame, that not only am I going to be able to just continue this, this great work, but I'm going to get a promotion. Hallelujah. That's faith. That when folks is getting fired and laid off and cutthroat type of stuff, you talk about, I'm about to get paid. I'm about to get an increase. I'm about to get a promotion. In fact, I'm going to go in and ask for a, a, a promotion. I'm going to ask for an increase of pay. I'm not waiting on them to decide when I should get more money. I'm going to go to them and say, you know what, John? I've been a, a really good worker here in the company, and um, I think I deserve to get a, a pay raise. What do you think about that? What we got to do to make that happen, John? That's faith right there. That's some, okay, we buy, we buy something right there. We're about to make something happen. So um, just in general, you want to make sure that you use your faith um, for the things you want, 
okay? The last time we prayed last Shabbat, I literally was praying and I was able to see and the emotional energy I had within me was seeing um, Davon and Levisi in the Arizona Assembly. I was able to see him in great health and I saw myself hugging both of them. And the emotional energy I had within me was that thing. That was real. I saw it, I receive it, it is. It's established. Why? Because now faith is. Now faith is. It's not a future tense thing. It's now faith is. So what you're believing for by faith, you receive it now. You believe and receive it now. It's happening now. It may not have manifested yet, but you're believing for it now. You're standing in agreement in the realm of the spirit. Because everything happens in the spiritual realm and then manifests in the natural. It's not good luck, it's faith. It's faith in action and, and, and having the emotional energy to come in line with your faith of what you believe for. Not doubt, not fear where then your faith is used as a weapon against you to give you what you don't want. Okay. So, um, again, um, just a little touch on, on prayer and faith, the importance of having the proper faith executed and not operating in fear. All right. So, um, I do have some scriptures I want to go through and read real quick and then we'll, we'll, um, close out the last little part here. It shouldn't take too much longer. Can I get somebody to read Second Kings chapter 17, please? Second Kings chapter 17. I can read that. Thank you. Start at verse 9. Just read verse 9. Okay. Get my thing back up. While you get that, can I get a second reader after she's done to read Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 15? But we're going to wait for her to go ahead and get. I do that. We're going to get her to get 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 9 ready. And then you want Isaiah what? 29 and 15. Okay, I do it. What was the verse again? Um, we'll verse 9. Verse 9, okay. Verse 9, yes. I'm reading out of King James. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against Lord, Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. Can we keep going? Nope. Read it one more time, please. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the Tower of the Watchmen to Fenced City. Okay. So I want to highlight real quick that some of our people foolishly think that they could do things secretly that the Most High is not going to know. Um, go ahead, uh, uh, Yudia. Read uh, Isaiah 29 and 15. Isaiah 29 and 15 from the secret. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Yahuwah. And their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? It's foolishness to think you could do things in secret at the most high is not going to know. Can I get somebody to read Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 12? Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 12. And I'll put these in the chat. But when you go ahead and get that, just jump right in and read it, please. Okay, I can read that. Then said, Whoever got it, go ahead and read it. It's fine. Okay, this is coming out of Hallelujah Scriptures, Ezekiel 8 and 12. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each one in the room of his idols? For they say, Yahuwah doesn't see us. Yahuwah has forsaken the land. So, read that one more time again, please. Okay. 
And he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each one of them in the room of his idols? For they say, Yahuwah does not see us. Yahuwah has forsaken the land. So right now, I'm going to tell you this right now, right here in America and definitely in uh, Africa, you have those people that are, you know, also they're fake Christians. They really still hold on to the, the traditions of their elders, um, but they, on the surface, they're Christians. That's how they feel. They feel like the Most High has forsaken the land, forsaken the people, and so therefore they're going to start dabbling in other stuff in the dark instead of being humble and going in repentance to the most high they're going to, be going to do one of two things keep deceiving themselves talking about the blessings pouring down on me prosperity prosperity gospel type stuff all right and 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 you know spending a hundred dollars for you know prosperity oil okay or they're going to turn to the ways of their fathers to do secret things in the dark because they feel like the most high is, is he ain't he he ain't thinking about us right now so we're gonna do our own thing and that's the foolish way to go can i get somebody to read proverbs 28 and 13 proverbs 28 and verse 13 i'll read it thank you i'm reading out of the sea Yeah, cut off. Say it again. Is this you there? All right, can I get somebody else to read it? She can't, she fell off somehow. All right, reading out of the Cephar. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. So these are biblical principles that if you don't confess your sin that you're dealing with, it's a wrap. If you don't confess the sins and the transgressions in your heart, you're done. But he that does confess those things shall be saved, shall be redeemed. Um, since you're right next to Proverbs, um, go to Psalms 90. In verse 8. All right. You have said, you have said our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. The Most High lays out your sins and your iniquities before his face. He knows all things. You can't hide from him what you got going on, what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Just keep it 1,000. One you you got to just be honest with yourself and honest before the Most High. Don't think the Most High don't see what's going on. He sees all things. Um, go with me to Jeremiah. Start off at Jeremiah chapter 16 and verse 17. Sixteen and seventeen. For my eyes are upon all their ways; they are not hid from my face. Neither is the iniquity hid from my eyes. Go with me next. Appreciate that to Jeremiah seventeen and ten. Reading out of the speaker. Can you hear me? Um. Yeah. If you can do get Jeremiah seventeen and ten, that'd be great. I'm not sure what happened earlier. You there? I'm not sure. Sis, uh, for some reason, it's cutting out still. I'm not sure what's happening. Can you make sure your phone is not muted? Or I'm not I'm sure. On what's my happening. laptop, it's um, I'm unmuted. That's you, okay, I think you might be in a bad area. That might be what it is. Um, it's kind of digital, so. Um, but I appreciate you trying. Though we'll have to do it next time. I can read it if someone needs to read it. Me, okay. I'm in the King James. I, Yahuwah, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, 
and according to the fruit of his doings. Read that one more time, please. I, Yahuwah, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways mm. and according to the fruit of his doings. Listen, just highlight that. Everybody <laughs> highlight that verse. Amen. Meditate on that before you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if that be hard, um, real talk. Let that be the one you make sure you highlight. All right. <laughs> if you can go to uh Jeremiah 23 and 24, please. Jeremiah 23 and 24. Maury, do I have a quick question on that last um, verse? Mm -hmm. in, in the Hallelujah Scriptures, it says, I, Yahuwah, search the heart, I try the kidneys and give every man according to his ways. Wow. I thought that was interesting that it, it says kidneys. Yes, because kidneys is associated, and that, that goes into the translation of a scripture. Mm-hmm. In regards to, it was believed that certain functions of the bodily organs were associated with certain things. So you okay. can, you as a translator, have the choice to translate it literally, or the function behind what it's saying. So, okay. but yeah, good point. Okay, when you're ready, go ahead and read that scripture. Can any hide himself? I'm sorry, Jeremiah 23 and 24, correct? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, mm, mm. saith the Most High? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Most High. Read that one more time. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Most High? Do not I fill the heaven and the earth, saith the Most High. Mm. Bottom line is you can't hide. There is no secret place for you. The only secret place you got is in the Most High. The only secret place you have is in the Most High. You cannot hide from the Most High. He knows everything. He sees everything. Everything is laid bare before him. So what you doing? Listen. Um, I'm trying to process through the magnitude of this whole thing. It doesn't matter what I do. I could do whatever I do, and y'all all think Maury Dwayne is the greatest brother on this earth. Walking this earth, man, Maury Dwayne is a real one, okay? But if inside, secretly, I'm wicked, secretly, I'm dealing with sin, and transgressions that I'm not willing to um, address or go before the Most High with, I got to give an account to the Most High at the end of the day. It don't matter about what y'all think about me. I'm not going to be able to go and be like, okay, let me let me go to Jeremy, let me go to Ressa, let me go to Monica, let me go to Ducey, let me go to Miala and have them vouch for me before the Most High. The Most High is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Judge of all Judges. Everything is laid bare. He searches out all things. Everything is laid bare. You can't go nowhere. You can't hide nothing from him. You can't bury the evidence of your crimes. So that's why I'm saying the Most High wants to do a work in your life. But if you're dealing with any type of secret sin, you got to put it up before the Most High. You have to take it before the Most High. This is something where I wasn't even preparing to do a message like this. I have something totally different prepared, but it's one of those things where the most high is like, listen, I desire to do a mighty work in these, my people, but I need the people literally to get it together because some of them are dealing with idolatry. Some of them are dealing with lust and fornication. Some of them got side pieces and they're committing adultery against their wives or their husbands. Some of them are abusing their spouses. Some of them are abusing their children. 
Some of them are addicted and they got idols of alcohol in their heart, in their mind. They are struggling with pornography. They go into the assemblies, hitting on every female that walks and moves, trying to get with them, talking about you the one. I'm going I'm to I'm lay with you. I'm going to be with you. I almost done. Um, Amos 9 and 3. Somebody read that for me, please. Amos 9 and 3. Amos 9 and 3. Somebody get that for me, please. Amos Amen. 9. Go ahead. Okay. Amos 9 and 3. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Ain't no hide. Last one. Um, Psalms 19 and 12. Psalms 19 and 12, please. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Read that one more time. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Who can truly understand their own error? Most high, cleanse me of my faults. Write that down, highlight that one. Write that down and highlight that one. Oh, Maury. This is this is oh, Mac. I have another one that's right on the lines of what you uh, what you're saying. It's uh, Psalms 139, verse one through three. If they want to read that, or if you want to read that, you can. But it's it's spot on. with saying exactly what you're saying here. And other scriptures on that. <clears throat> Go ahead and read it. Okay. Oh yeah, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art adequate with all my ways. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Hallelujah. So um, I'm done. I'm done with that. Um, and if you can, go ahead and put that scripture into the uh, chat. Somebody can put that on there um, so we can have that on record. And then um, I'll share this in the different various groups as well as the um, online, all these different scriptures. So um, we're going to transition now. It's not going to take too much longer, but we're going to go into the Testament of Naphtali. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite testaments of the patriarchs is the Testament of Naphtali. Take notes, highlight. We're going to break it down. But before we transition, does anyone else that's on the line, we've we got roughly 20-something people still here um, with us right now. Does anyone have any other um, words they want to um, bring forth about the discussion of the secret place? All right. Anybody have anything else they want to talk about before we transition on to the testing of Naphtali? Go ahead and jump right in. Okay. So. I'm in here. I'll go ahead, sis. Sorry about that. Um, when we were talking about the different types of transgressions that we commit, um, sometimes my pride will, will keep me from seeing my transgression because I'm comparing it to somebody else's and it's not like theirs, so it's not really a transgression. Or my pride will take me to the extreme where um, y'all's dealing with me about something he's shown me a something that is not necessarily sin in and of itself, but it's my sin, it's something for me. And I try to throw that on everybody else. And I, now I become judgmental and well, she's doing this or he's doing that. And that's not something that y'all's dealing with them about. He's dealing with me about that. And keeping my eyes on him and off of other people in cleaning out, you can't clean your, 
11 out of your house if you're trying to sweep somebody else's porch. And so understanding for myself that trying to make it a universal issue is not beneficial, I guess is the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your the discussion about the prayer and the doubt, I think that the lesson you taught about knowing knowing who he, who he is, knowing him will help us to know his voice versus any other voice. And in recognizing his voice, it's crucial for us as we listen to him that we don't mistake prep, preparation as the sister earlier was saying, preparation for fear. Because you can't get ready to fight anybody if you're afraid that that preparation and sharpening your sword is fear. Because it's not. It's obedience. I mean, Noah should have been scared, and that's why he built the ark. Fear, yeah, you know, and do what he says. And so sometimes we get paralyzed between the two places by looking at, well, I don't want to be getting food or anything like that because maybe – that's going to look like I'm scared. No, that's going to look like you're wise and that you're looking at, at the times in front of you and understanding that all things are not well. And so fear Yah, believe what he said, know that what's coming is coming and get some supplies in your home and sharpen your sword. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was all. No, it's very good. You, we can't be just judging ourselves or comparing ourselves to other people. When the most high is dealing with you on something, you can't say, well, they doing something over there. I ain't talking to them. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to them about their stuff. That's I'm talking to them. We have a conversation together. So it's really a form of trying to deflect from the most high what he's trying to do with you uh, to not take accountability. So it's good that you're recognizing that to, to deal with those issues. Like we all have to assess ourselves in that way. Uh, very, very good. Very, very good. Um, and this thing is serious. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into, I'm just tapping this. I get tap. Um, when you look at how we move during the time of going into the Holy Land, the Promised Land, we all had to be on one accord. And if one house was in discord and out of order, it affected everybody. Let that sink in. You know, we got 20-something folks on this call right now. And if we got to move as a unit, as one, each and every one of us has to be obedient to the call that the Most High has placed on our individual lives. Because although individual, we make up one unit, one house. We can't allow the house to fall because of some rogue dude is being disobedient. And you see that in the script where, you know, Yausha was basically out there warring trying to take the promised land the most i told him go do this thing and he went out there and go did the thing and he got his tail kicked and these folks are dying he's wondering what's going on this doesn't make no sense because when you got the strength of the most high and you got malak yahuwah going before you fighting your battles why did we lose why did we get ran off it's because they're sending the camp there's sin in the house to the point where they had to go and figure out who did what. Somebody did something they shouldn't have did that jeopardized the entire body, the entire house, because one dude went rogue and did what he was not supposed to do. That's how important this is to walk in faith, to walk in obedience, especially when it comes to warfare and going forth to claim what's rightfully ours. We can't be out of step with one another. We got to be obedient to the very end. To the last man, last woman, last boy, last girl, we got to be about that life and, and be on one accord. We ain't never moved like that in our lifetime in America. It ain't never been like that. But that's where we have to move. We have to move that way. All right, anybody else? There was one other person. Go ahead, jump right in, and then we'll get started. Okay, so uh, one of the issues I've been having is um, I've been recording music that I make up, um, whether on guitar or piano, for like something like 20 years now. A few years ago, the thought had crossed my mind, like uh, 
I had saw my tapes. That's what I used to record them on was tapes, uh, crinkling in my head as, as though they was like burning or something, but it wasn't like they weren't on fire, but like the only thing I could think to explain it would have been fire. So I guess that's coming to my mind now is there's something, and th there's no words on them. So it's not really painfully obvious to me if it would be considered you know, against the most high or something he finds not pleasing, mm -hmm. but it, it comes to, the only thing I could say that, that makes me not want to ignore it is the fact that it comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Should I like burn them tapes, get rid of them tapes? I mean, this is, we're talking like close to 50, 60 tapes here. Uh, so here's the thing. Each individual person has something that they have to deal with, meaning I can't partic particularly tell you what you should do in regards to your situation on that level. The wisdom and counsel I can give you is that this, what you're dealing with is what you're dealing with. You have to go to the most high to see if that's something he needs you to do. Meaning the only thing I could think of is if that isn't somehow some type of idol in your heart that you've set up consciously or subconsciously that he wants you to deal with. But um, again, each individual person has to give account to the most high specific to them because um, having a collection of cassette tapes of music might not be something that the most high is going to deal with John about or Curly or Mo or something like that. Right. Um, but that might be something that he needs to deal with you about specifically for whatever that reason might be. So something on that level, I have no clue. I would say you need to go to the most high in prayer in regards to that Definitely. to see if that's something, if that's a legitimate thing, um, and then do whatever he tells you to do. The bottom line for each and every one of us as we search ourselves out is simply to be obedient to what he calls you to do. So like for me, when the most I told me, I can't take you where I need to take you. Like I need to take you this place. I have, I, you're, the path that I have laid out for you, I can't get you there with this sin in your life. So therefore I had to remove it from my life. Okay. Um, so for each and every one of us, regardless of what it might be, it may seem monumental. It may seem insignificant to somebody else. It doesn't matter. Whatever the most high impresses on you to do, be obedient and do it. That's really what it comes down to. All right. Anybody else um, have anything they want to say before we sure. transition into the Testament of Naphtali? All right. When you, um, you made the, just the statement about what's pressing on you, what the most high tell you to do, what came to mind was the different, uh, can never remember that scripture, but it does come to mind often now. The, the different um, gentlemen that had buried their gifts. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like he he gave them gifts and people were burying their gifts. He was putting them and hiding them. And that can, in, I mean, for me, that can get me in worse trouble with the most high because it's like I've given you a gift and something that you have within you is for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you keep burying it from whatever reason, like with me with the, the doubt situation, there's people that, you're going to be that I need to use you to get to them so they can get to me and you're bearing your gift and you won't ever get that opportunity. Those people can be lost because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. And that's what you were, you were telling me when you was talking about my doubt. Cause even when we were talking about the praise and worship dance and everything, I remember you saying, it don't matter your size, Lisa. if that's what the most high has called you forth to do, that's what he's called you forth to do because there's somebody that needs to see that form of praise and worship mm -hmm. in his, his, cause you think about Miriam and all them, there's, there's a, a reason for that. Just like you was telling me about the other stuff, you know? So I understand. And it's just, it's hard. It's just, cause when you know, he, he's smacking you on your head, <laughs> you're like, okay, father, I got you. And then you take two steps back. He, I told you, I mean, he's our dad. He's going to, he's going to get you. One way or another, either going to get you while you're on this earth, or you going to mess around and wait until you get in front of him, and then it's too late. So, I mean, I completely understand what you're saying. You know, we all, listen, um, we all have to 
do what we've been called to do. Uh, don't let that burn inside your chest. All those things that the Most High has, has set for you to do. There's some people that there's an anointing on you to speak. There's a, there's a wisdom and discernment that you have that um, you are called to actually teach or deliver or prophesy or proclaim in the name of the Most High, but you're scared. You, you're over there scary acting and don't want to talk. And so in essence, that person, that type of person in this example is literally burying their gift. The Most High gave something to you, imparted something to you, and because of your disobedience, well, there you go. Because of your unfaithfulness, there you go. Now there's a delay. Um, I'll tell you, there's times where the Most High has told me um, not to release a certain video. And I'm like, okay, don't even question anymore. Why? Because it might not be the time for that video to be released. Then it'll be release that video. And then it blows up and then people are blessed by it and um, they're reached by the message within that video. Um, we have to walk out our life in faith and not fear um, because it's not about us as much as it is our obedience because the most high appointed you to be born when you were born. He appointed you to be born to the parents you were born to. Yes, some things happen, good, some bad. You made some mistakes, but you're going through the process because the Most High needed you to fulfill your destiny in this time and season. And so it don't matter. You might be tall, you might be short. You might be big, you might be skinny. You might be curvy, you might be a stick. You might be strong, you might be physically weak. You might have a strong authoritative voice. You might have a timid voice. Um, it don't matter. You have to do what the Most High has called you to do because the authority and the power is not in your own strength of your arm, but it's in the Most High. And because of your obedience, he can do what he needs to do. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to tell one story. You got to know I got stories. I'm going to tell one story in relation to this, and then we're going to move forward. Because I, I know it's getting long, but we in the house. So some of you have heard the story. Most of you haven't. One of my personal short call, shortcomings or shortfalls was a time where um, the most I was speaking to me, like he often usually does, but he was in my younger days when he was really pressing on me um, on various things. I was driving in my car and anybody that knows the old me, you know, I could ride on E in my car, like nobody's business. Like my light could be blazing, screaming in my face. And I'm like, I'm good. I know I got a couple more miles for whatever reason. That's my mindset that that Negro mindset. I was like, I'm good. Well, this day I had literally a little less than half a tank of gas. Most of I was like, go get some gas. I'm like, that's weird, but I've learned to, I'm going to be obedient. So, even though it's not my style and I don't need to, I'm good. I went and I went to the gas station. So I was in California. I went to an Arco gas station. I parked my car and I was thinking, okay, so what? Did you just... I have no idea what that is. Somebody's phone's farting. That was, that was rude. <laughs> that's going to be on the videotape too. Oh man, that's funny. Anyway, um, I have, you know, I'm, I'm questioning, do I go inside or do I just pay at the pump? So I'm like, I'm going to go inside. I go inside and I see a woman and she's a mother and her child is probably a little more than a year old, maybe a year and a half old, less than two years old. But the baby had a huge goiter on his neck and I was in shock. It threw me off. Um, 
I was not expecting that. In my natural, I was not expecting that. Now, the reality is that the Most High wanted me to lay hands on that baby and to pray for that baby, for the healing of that baby. I did not do a thing. I literally punked out, out of shock more than fear. I wasn't afraid of getting a tumor or some type of cyst in my body off of touching the baby, nothing like that. It was just shocking to be in that situation. But the bottom line is the Most High wanted me to pray for the mother and pray for that baby to bring healing to that child. And I didn't do it. So that is on my hands. Sadly and unfortunately, the very real possibility is that child may have died with the illness that was plaguing it. And that blood's gonna be in my hands because I did not do what I was led to do, which was to pray for the mother and for the healing of that baby. Um, I dealt with that for many weeks, many months, trying to you know, process through like, man, like, I can't believe. Um, re reality is also again that because of my disobedience and not doing what I was led to do during that season, during that time, that led to a delay for that mother and that child where that wasn't the point of time that the Most High said, okay, I could use my son. I'm going to lead him and have him go to this gas station to be in the situation to do what he knows what he's supposed to do in that situation. And I didn't do it. This is my young days, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Um, and that is a um, failure on my part that I have to live with and had to deal with. I'm good now, obviously, but it's something that that's something where I tell that story so people know the reality of things. It's everyday, real life. Every, I'm an everyday person just like you. I have my ups and my downs. I'm going through the process just like you. Uh, but in that situation, I dropped the ball which caused the delay of that mother and child from receiving their healing if they receive their healing at all. So don't allow that situation to happen to you where when you're put in a position to speak, you don't. When you're put in a, in a position to pray for the healing of, of a mother and their child, of one who's afflicted and you keep your mouth shut. You gotta give account for that. And I've had to give account for that. The Most High took me to task on that. And I've never forgot that. I never will forget that. Um, but that's a personal failing in my own life in that when I was led to do something on behalf of the Most High, when the time came, I dropped the ball. So I don't want that to be the case for you guys. So make sure that when you're led to speak, you speak. When you're led to pray, you pray. If the Most High calls you to be obedient to a certain task at hand, do it. If you fall um, into sin, you better get your life. Repent and get up. Otherwise, you'll be destroyed. So um, that's all I have to say in regards to that. I just wanted to, to bring that out that this is real, okay? Um, you don't want to be the cause of someone's delayed blessing. You don't wanna be the cause of someone's delayed healing. You don't wanna be the cause of someone's death because when you could have spoke life into them to elevate their faith, you chose to be silent or to reinforce the doubt they already hold on to. Anyway, um, we're going to go ahead and get into the Testament of Nathalie. Anybody have anything they are feel pressed to say before we transition? Say it now. Yes, Moray, this is Terry. Can hey, you hear me? Yeah, shalom. Shalom. Um, 
I have a question for what you just said. Mm -hmm. What if we go forth to do something that we believe that is led of y'all mm -hmm. and we got it wrong? You got to dig a little bit deeper in regards to got it wrong. What is that? In this hypothetical situation, in this hypothetical situation, what does getting it wrong mean? What's the threshold to say you got it wrong? Okay. Say for something, it can be uh, just to say something uh, simple. Let me go with something very simple. Mm -hmm. A kind word to an individual. Okay. Um, and that person doesn't even receive it or, or they go off on you or being nice to someone and a gun is drawn up to in your face this kind of thing you got it. got it wrong you i guess you said missed the mark you just didn't understand exactly what um what you believe that y'all was leading you to do or to say that's what i mean so ultimately it's not your responsibility how a person responds or reacts to what you've been called to do meaning I could have asked a lady, hey, mama, um, I'm a man of the most high. You know, I, I feel led to pray. Would you mind if I pray for you and for your daughter? She could have said, hell no. Nah. And I got to say, okay. But I did what I was called to do. I did what I was led to do, regardless of how she responds back to me. Um, I've had situations where I'm in my own prayer for the most high, seeking the most high and fervent prayer for my own situation. And I ain't getting nothing, too, like nothing, darkness, nothing. And then the most high out of nowhere will go, go walk all the way across and go talk to that woman sitting on that bench or that man sitting on that bench and tell them this. And I'm like, what about me? You know, I'm trying to get prayer to answer. I'm sitting here seeking you day and night. I'm burning my lunch break up every hour, every day for months. And I'm trying to seek your ear for my own situation. And I'm hearing crickets. Yet, you talking off so lot for these other folks. Internal conversation, I'm just letting y'all in. That's how I was feeling. So I'm like, I'm going to be obedient. I go and I say what the most I told me to tell to the person. Oftentimes they look at me like I'm crazy. Sometimes they still look at me like I'm crazy, but they're more or less in shock because it's, it's hitting them in the chest. So each person has the free will to either receive it or reject what they hear. No different than the most I might call on you to uh, give the truth to somebody, a, a family member or a loved one. I'm going to tell you right now, um, some of you that are online watching this right now, you have prayed for your loved ones. You have gone to your loved ones with this truth and they've rejected it. And you're sad and you're hurting inside. And you're like, I don't understand. How come they don't want to see the truth? Why do they want to be deceived? They know this ain't right, what they're dealing with right now. And I'm giving them the truth and I'm showing them with evidence and they don't want to receive it. That's the situation. Those same family members, I'm letting you know right now, have contacted me. They ain't contacted you. They've contacted me from separated wives from their husbands, from husbands separated from their wives to mamas that are questioning my son is trying to bring this to me what they're talking about to grandma and great grandma have contacted me in regards to this truth in regards to this walk so you may not know the fruit that's being birthed out of your obedience and your family members and loved ones i'm letting you know right now you don't see the fruit of what's taking place but you've planted the seed. You've 
you've put in the groundwork, you've tilled the soil for them to even be able to receive. They may not receive from you because you they they cousin or they son or they mama or or they daddy. Okay. But the ground is being tilled, the soil is being turned over, the seeds been planted, and they may go to other people for the full revelation to get them on the right path. Like I'm telling you, honest truth. I've had people from wives that have been separated from their husbands to great grandmas that have contacted me asking me about the Hebraic faith because the most high led them. I've had people that have told me, I don't know why. And some of you might even be on this call, but they're like, I don't even know why, but the most high led me to reach out to you. I've had people come telling me, you know what? I've tried to share content with other people and my husband is not about, about that life. He ain't trying to hear it. But for you, my husband said he can listen to you for some reason. He can receive from you. That's why it's so important for each and every one of us to allow your voice to shine, to go forth and be obedient because you never know. You are the answered prayer for other people, for your brothers and sisters that are on this call right now. You are your brother's keeper. You are your sister's keeper. When they're in their dark place, you're the one that goes in and reaches them out where they're at. Because you are the light of the most high to them where they, when, when they need you. When they need you. So hopefully that helps. All right, y'all. We can stay on this for a minute, but we got to get on to close out with the uh, the testament of Naphtali. All right, last time, anybody else have anything they want to say? All right. I thank you all that have joined us this far. Um, we're going to go ahead and get right into this. This won't take long. It might take us another 15 minutes um, and then we'll be out, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and read this. And then after that, um, you know, I'm gonna go section at a time and then I'm gonna open it up for uh, discussion. All right, so we are now going into a midrashic element of the Shabbat fellowship. What is a midrash? Midrash. A midrash is for us to discuss the scripture. Now, my, my challenge to you is, again, stay on task, stay on topic, okay? Don't go out into the, the nether regions of, of uh, discussion. Stay in the framework of the lesson. Um, everything needs to be rooted in what we're actually reading, not other works, unless it's Torah and is directly tied into this. Try to keep it based off of this. All right, so Let's go ahead and begin. And again, I pray that um, we have ears to hear and receive uh, the wisdom that comes from the testament of our patriarchs. So, the testament of Naphtali, the eighth son of Yaakov and Bilcha. The copy of the testament of Naphtali, which he ordained at the time of his death in the 130th year of his life when his sons were gathered together in the seventh month on the first day of the month, while still in good health, he made them a feast of food and wine. Afterwards, he was awake in the morning. He said unto them, I'm dying. And they believed him not. And as he glorified in Yahuwah, he grew strong and said that after yesterday's feast, he should die. And he began then to say, hear my children, ye sons of Naphtali, hear the words of your father. I was born from Bilha, and because Rachel dealt craftily and gave Bilha in place of herself to Yaakov, and she conceived and bare me upon Rachel's knees, Rachel's knees, therefore she called my name Naphtali, for Rachel, or Rachel, loved me very much, 
because I was born upon her lap. And when I was still young, she was wont to kiss me and say, may I have a brother of thine from my own womb like unto thee. Once also Yosef or Joseph was like unto me in all things according to the prayers of Raquel or Rachel. Now my mother was Bilha, daughter of Rothias, the brother of Deborah, Rebecca's or Rivka's nurse, who was born on one and the selfsame day with Rachel. And Rothias was of the family of Abraham, a Chaldean, God-fearing, freeborn, and noble. And he was taken captive and was bought, redeemed by Laban. And he gave him Yuna, his handmaid to wife. And she bore a daughter and called her name Zilpha, after the name of the village in which he had been taken captive. Next, she bore Bilcha, saying, my daughter hastens after what is new. For immediately that she was born, she seized the breast and hastened to suck it. All right, I'm gonna stop right there. That was chapter one. Go ahead and unmute yourself. And any thoughts in regards to that first chapter? And jump right in again. We got 20 something folks here on the call. Um, don't just be a here, but also um, jump right in and get your insight into what you took away from that, that passage. One thing I, um, which the normal, the regular 66 books, I should say, don't talk about is the fact that um, how much Rachel really loved Natalie. Mm -hmm. um, that's not spoken of. And I find that rather interesting, especially given the fact that Rachel was constantly, you know, once she had Joseph, you know, then she still wanted, you know, she had Benjamin, but um, just her constant, I need a child, I need a child. But here she took Natalie as hers mm -hmm. and still had that desire to want, you know, yes. another child. Very you good. Know. Very, very good. Very, very good. That was her way of trying to, you know, get, get back at Leah. It was like, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and have Bilha do it, you know, and have her son as my own. And she loved him. That's awesome. Again, jump right in, please. I find it interesting that Natalie's sons um, or his family didn't believe him when he told them that he was going to pass. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at that and it's a matter of, dad, you look fine. And we had this great feast and you look so strong. What are you talking about? So, yep. Anyone else? Bring it out. Let's go. I, uh, I like how much, how much he personally knows about his, you know, immediate ancestors where you know, who was taken into captivity and who redeemed who and, and, you know, all of that. That's a lot of our, in this day, confusion and, and disconnect from the culture is because we don't have that. We don't know. We don't know our grandparents' stories. We don't know our great-grandparents' stories. You know, I personally don't. Um, I know one, one side of my family's stories, you know, fairly well, but the other half, I have no idea, you know, so I don't, I, I can't connect to those roots and I can't connect you know, to that tree because, because it was severed. And I think it's really beautiful, um, you know, how he can just lay it all out there. Well, this was so-and-so and this happened to them and, and this, that, and the other. So that's what I took away from it. Amen. I had a question in, uh, in regards to this feast. Is this a particular like Moedim feast or is this just a general feast that they that they threw? 
So it all depends when you look at it and I I'm not gonna answer that question. What I will ask you to do is to research for yourself. So when you look at that part, it talks about when the sons were gathered together in the seventh month, the first day of the month. All right, so research that seventh month and specifically the first day of the month. Okay. All right. All right, jump right in, please. I'm in the version that I was reading in verse six. Um, is that, it says that he was, how he was conceived, it was in trickery. Is that what the ver what, what you're reading, is that what that means? It can mean that, but it's more craftiness than trickery. Trickery, that's the problem with the English language. Words do mean things and even varying right. words. And we just kind of like, I don't really care what they really mean. It kind of sounds like that, so that sounds cool. Uh, there's a difference between yeah. craftiness and trickery. Mm -hmm. um, craftiness is could be could be determined as as wise, um, intuitive. There's different words you can use to define that in regards to craftiness versus to say trickery because it's not trickery. She didn't trick anybody. In crafty in craftiness, she said, "Okay, my sister is having and bearing all these children, and I bear none. I'm bearing." I mm -hmm. know what I'll do. I will go ahead and I will give my maid servant Bilha to my husband to bear a child for me. Right. And so, that, so that's, that's the thing. Um, it's not trickery. She didn't trick herself. She didn't trick Bilha. She didn't trick Yaakov. It was something that was decided upon craftily, wise counsel. Right, because it was odd. It just stuck out strangely because she, how she left him so openly, and there was trickery, as it said. So, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, no, no problem. And um, if you guys can make sure your volume is turned down moderately, so you can still hear. All right, um, because the feedback into the um, microphone will distort. Um, Anyone else on chapter one? Because there's a, a key thing that's there that you guys have skipped over so far. Um, uh, Maury, it's just my Allah again. One thing I was noticing with verse 12, mm -hmm. where it talks about Bill Ha saying, my daughter hastens after what is new. Um, I find that interesting that that's how she was named. And it seems like when Rebecca, you know, said, hey, you know, um, take Bilha, my handmaiden, she, this handmaiden probably was, this is something new, something exciting, something that I can do. And that's, I'm kind of reading that in that scripture. There you go, it's good. All right, one thing that's been missed is in verse 10 or section 10, and that it goes in regards to who were, who were Bilha and Zilpha. Because in the 66, you don't see where they come from. You just know of them as just some handmaidens or whatever, like they're just chilling at the house. You don't get the revelation that these are Hebrews from the house of Abram. You don't get that, but they are. So these are Hebrew women. These are not Canaanite women or Gentile women. These are Hebrew women. And so it breaks down about their father and how he was redeemed by uh, Laban, it says, um, what is that? I want to say it was like purchased or something like that, but really it means redeemed because he, he was taken captive and he was redeemed by Laban. So it says, and he was taken captive and was bought by Laban. It's not bought, it's proper, it will be redeemed. That's what you do. You got to redeem your brethren. You got to re redeem your sister. That's what we got to do to this day. We have to redeem each other. All right. So um, I wanted to point that out. Don't don't overlook that part. That point. Now you have the ability to see that uh, Zilpha and Bilha come from the house of Abram. These are not strange women that were born bearing children in the house of Israel. All right. 
I'm gonna keep going again. Um, please jump in. We have enough people online that I don't want it to be where we're just kind of sitting here, just hanging out. Like, you know, I want you to have your voice. A lot of you um, want to jump on these calls, so uh, please take part. Uh, chapter two. And I was swift on my feet like the deer, and my father Yaakov appointed me for all messages, and as a deer did he give me his blessing. For as the potter knoweth the vessel, how much it is to contain, and bringeth clay according, so also doth Yah make the body after the likeness of the spirit, and according to the capacity of the body doth he implant the spirit. And the one does not fall short of the other by a third part of a hair, for by weight and measure and rule was all the creation made. And as the potter knoweth the use of each vessel, what is meat for, so also doth Yah know the body, how far it will persist in goodness, and when it will begin in evil. For there is no inclination or thought which Yah knoweth not, for he created every man after his own image. For as a man's strength, so also is his work. As his eye, so also is his sleep. As his soul, so also is his word, either in the law of Yah or in the law of Baal. And as there is a division between light and darkness, between seeing and hearing, so also is there a division between man and man, between woman and woman. And it is not to be said that the one is like the other, either in face or in mind, for Elohim made all things good in their order. The five senses in the head, and he joined on the neck to the head, adding to it the hair also for comeliness and glory. Then the heart, for understanding, the belly for excrement, the stomach for grinding, the windpipe for taking in the breath, the liver for wrath, the gall for bitterness, the spleen for laughter, the reins for prudence, the muscles of the loins for power, the lungs for drawing in, the loins for strength, and so forth. And so then, my children, let all your works be done in order, with good intent in the fear of Elohim, and do nothing disorderly in scorn or out of its due season. For if thou bid the eye to hear, it cannot. So neither while you are in darkness can you do the works of light. And I'll open it up from right there. What are your thoughts? This that totally sounds powerful. like some of the script. Yes. This, oh. this kind of reminds, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. So, some of the scriptures we were just reading was saying like he know like okay what the one was that uh psalm i'm gonna say psalm um 134 139 one through four where you saying like you know my when i go to sit down you know when i go to stand up you know my thoughts are far off basically sounding like like before i even have them this this kind of goes into the detail with which he creates every person with which he creates everything like I don't even know how to word it. It's just amazing. Amen. I'd like to add that the Most High is, I mean, this is clearly just showing us that though we doubt ourselves, he's telling us plainly that he's given us everything we need to carry out the function that he created us in. Mm -hmm. And that each of our functions are different from the other. So not to look to do what some else, someone else is doing to, to do what you were created to do. Amen. Great point. Anyone else jump right in? Um, I, also, I, go on. Oh, thank you. Um, I really resonated with um, 14. So also doth the Lord make the body after the likeness of the spirit. And according to the capacity of the body, does he implant the spirit? And that's just so meaningful, um, you know, for all of us, um, you know, how he just created us in his likeness and, um, and in his image. And he just knows us from head to toe and every, um, oh, I'm sorry, from head to toe and every hair um, and knowing our comings and our goings before they even happen. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm so grateful for that. Great, great point. Oh, yeah. And, and she was on the same scripture that I was looking at in that my thoughts were he has perfectly matched up our spirits with our bodies. There was no mismatch or anything because he fully understood how we are to be and how we are to walk and what gifts he has given us to use for his glory. Mm -hmm. And he has perfectly matched us up with that. Amen. Anybody else? Um, yes, my, my takeaway from it was that, you know, the most high is, um, he's an Elohim of, of order and function. And I think that that's something that we keep seeing over and over and over again in the scriptures, that he's about his order and he's about the function. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is something for us to remember that, you know, that that's how we have to be also, that we have to stay in the order and that we have to realize that everything that he does has an order to it and there's function behind whatever he's asking us to do. Amen. Yeah, I just, um, verse six through, well, kind of through the rest of it, but just how everything relates <clears throat> in man, a man's strength to his work and his mind to his skill, um, his purpose to achievement, and of course, his heart to his mouth, right? Is that, you know, the overflow of the heart, so the mouth speaks. And I, one that I really like is his eye also to his sleep. Because um, the eye, you know, in Hebrew can, it doesn't just mean, you know, something you see with. But, you know, whatever you desire after, whatever you look upon and long for, can determine the kind of sleep or peace that you have. And if you're covetous, right, if your eye is wanting, then then your sleep is probably lacking or disturbed. But if you're not wanting after something that you shouldn't have, then you most likely have a peaceful sleep. But just that how, how perfect his organization is, um, and, and when you are within that organization, and when you are operating within that order, right, when you're tov or functional, mm -hmm. then, then your life probably has great shalom. It should have sh shalom. There shouldn't be anything chaotic or disruptive or anything about your life. And so, you know, like, <clears throat> where it says in the end of six, either in the Torah of Yahuwah, right? You either live in the instructions and the way of Yah or in the works of Baal. And so anytime that you step out of that instruction or that Torah of Yah and you step foot on the path or the, the chaos of Baal, your life is going to start to fall apart. And, and I just love how just succinctly <laughs> he puts it here. Like, you know, he wraps up like, so much of Torah, so much of the 66 in this one little chapter, and it's so clean, and it's so neat, and, and it describes this one little chapter can give you more insight than, than, you know, reading the entire 66, because sometimes you don't really know what's what, and it gets a little confusing, you know, to us, because we lack an understanding, but this just makes it so clean and so clear, and I, I just, I just love that in these, in these books, um, how much more detail and insight you get into stuff that I've been, you know, reading for years and, and this little chunk just gave me more insight to certain things that, that I had never gotten before. Praise God. All right, let's jump into chapter three. Um, be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness or with vain words to beguile your souls. Because if you keep silence and purity of heart, you shall understand how to hold fast the will of Elohim and to cast away the will of Baal. Sun and moon and stars change not their order, so do ye also change not the law of Elohim and the disorderliness of your doings. The Gentiles went astray and forsook Yahuwah, changed their order and obeyed stocks and stones. Spirits of deceit, but you shall not be so, my children, recognizing in the firmament, in the earth, and in the sea, and in all created things, Yahuwah, who made all things, that you become not as Sodom, which changed the order of nature, homosexuality, and perversion. 
In like manner, the watchers also changed the order of their nature, whom Yah cursed at the flood, on whose account he made the earth without inhabitant and fruitless. That is chapter three. Go ahead and jump right in on that one. Jump right in. It just goes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it just goes back to you know something that that rebirth as a whole has been hitting really hard lately, lately, and that's the order, and not just any order, but Yah's order. Like there is a specific order to things. He created everything in order for an order for a purpose, and when you step outside of that, I mean, we have examples to look to: Sodom, right, and and Amora, like nothing good happened to those nothing good happened to the watchers who stepped outside of that i mean he flooded the entire earth because things were out of order and he had to come back and drastically reinstate that order so it's just you know adding to what we're learning about now how absolutely important it is and how much he loves his order he so loved the order right that he sent his only begotten son so order is everything to you absolutely hallelujah that's Pretty much what I was going to say is like with, with, with uh, how precise everything was with the last lessons with what they were trying to tell you, hey, don't do this because look, I did it and this is what happened. It's kind of like that. That last chapter was all about how precise everything is to, you know, to perfection. And then this one is like, look at all of these times where that order was disobeyed or, or went away from. And we don't know anything good about Sodom and Gomorrah. There's nothing good to hear about when it comes to the watchers. And yeah, that's just, it's like a testament to how much you should take heed and how important it is to stay within that order. Yeah, I was going to bring out um, just how it says um, the, to like not be so fast and trying to speak, but keep in silence and purity of heart um, so that you don't beguile yourself with covetousness or vain words. Just think that that's just real key you know a lot of times we we rush to try to like say something or or whatever but we might just trip our own self up on our own words so and actually uh that verse spoke to me also because uh, that's one of the things that i feel like the most i had been dealing with me with is just to keep silent sometimes um you know because we see things we see people doing things you know we observe different behaviors or you know and uh, i wouldn't do that or she shouldn't have said that or he shouldn't have said that but sometimes it's to, just about being silent because if you speak too soon sometimes you 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 speak on something that if you would have just kept silent you could have seen it through and you might not have had to say anything anyway and so um I, i'm just learning just to kind of keep silent and observe and, and, and not judge so quickly, but just through silence and observance, you know, just allowing the most high to let things, um, you know, let his will be done. And for me just to be silent. Praise God. Wisdom. All right, let's jump right into uh, chapter four. These things I say unto you, my children, for I have read in the writings of Ni'inach that you yourselves shall also depart from Yah, walking according to all the lawlessness of the Gentiles, and you shall do according to all the wickedness of Sodom. Mm, mm, mm. And Yah shall bring captivity upon you, and there you shall serve your enemies, and you shall be bowed down with every affliction and tribulation until Yah have consumed you all. And after you have become menaced and have tribulation, uh, progress. And after you have become minished and few, you shall return and acknowledge Yahuwah, your Elohim. And he shall bring you back into your land according to his abundant mercy. And it shall be that after that they come into the land of their fathers, they shall again forget Yah and become ungodly. And Yah shall scatter them upon the face of all the earth until the compassion of Yah shall come. And man working righteousness and working mercy unto all them that are far off 
and to them that are near. So open that up. Again, that's a short chapter, chapter four. Um, what I was going to say with that is, first, wow, that <laughs> I'm just like, my goodness. Um, but for him to even, you know, telling them, hey, you know, according, you know, to Enoch, that this is what's going to happen. Pay attention that you are going to fall away from Yah. You're going to follow other nations and their Elohims and do wickedness, basically forgetting the Torah. And he's going to bring you back, though. But then you're going to mess up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow. I, I, I'm just blown away by how they, we were told this. Do not. This is what's going to happen. So don't, don't do this. But we still hard-headed. Yeah, we live in proof that here we are in this yeah. latter portion. Here we are. This is us. So Hallelujah. I'm uh, we, we had touched on something like this a couple of Shabbats ago, right, Maury, like where we were just fresh out of uh, our ancestors were just fresh out of captivity and started getting everything going. And then everybody had to like start mourning and, and, and trying to atone with the most high because it had gotten out that people start slipping and doing the same stuff from Miss Ryan. Yep. Anybody else? Good points. Yeah, I just, it it makes the disconnect between us and Yah so glaringly obvious when I read stuff like this, because it's not just one person, you know, can prophesy or has a revelation or can speak directly about Yah or for Yah, but like all of these patriarchs in, in one way or another are prophesying about the future, are, are you know, revealing hidden matters and you know, here we are just kind of still groping in the darkness, you know, looking for a little bit here and there, but, but it's so clear how connected they all are back then. And I just, you know, I, I pray and, and look forward to the day when we can be as connected as they are. Yes, indeed. Ah, man. Anybody else? I have a statement that's uh, kind of a question. In the um, fifth verse, that looks like a messianic uh, prophecy going on here. Am I seeing that correctly? Yes. Because again, the belief, even down to Enoch prophesied of the Messiah, of the Messiah you know, so that's ba like, literally he's, he's talking about how he studied the, he studied Enoch, you know, that our ancestor and is basically prophesying to them that, I read in the last days, you will do these things. And by the revelation of the Most High, he's revealing to them the things that they're going to be doing until that time where the Messiah comes on the scene and makes things right in his mercy. So, all right, let's jump into uh, chapter five because I don't want to hold you on uh, too much longer. Um, we have a total of nine chapters to go. We're in chapter five. Uh, for in the 40th year of my life, I saw a vision on the Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem that the sun and the moon were still, were standing still. All right. This is emotional for me. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to regain myself here. My composure It's kind of emotional. Hang in there, y'all. All right. For in the 40th year of my life, I saw a vision on the Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem that the sun and the moon were standing still. And behold, Isaac, the father of my father, said to us, run and lay hold of them, each one according to his strength. And to him that seizes them will the sun and the moon belong. And we all ran together. And Levi laid hold of the sun. Judah outstripped the others and seized the moon. And they were both of them lifted up with them. And when Levi came, as the sun, lo, a certain young man gave to him 12 branches of palm, and Judah was bright as the moon, and under his feet were 12 rays. And the two, Levi and Judah, ran and laid hold of them, and lo, a bull upon the earth with two great horns and an eagle's wings upon its back, and we wished to seize him, but could not. 
But Yosef came and seized him and ascended up with him on high. And I saw, for I was there, and behold, a holy writing appeared unto us, saying, Assyrians, Medes, Persians, Chaldeans, Syrians shall possess in captivity the twelve tribes of Israel. And again, after seven days, I saw our father Yaakov standing by the sea of Yamia, and we were with him. And behold, there came a ship sailing by without sailors or pilot. And there was written upon the ship, the ship of Yaakov. And our father said to us, come, let us embark on our ship. And when we had gone on board, there arose a vehement storm and a mighty tempest of wind. And our father who was holding the helm departed from us. And we being tossed with the tempest were borne along over the sea and the ship was filled with water and was pounded by mighty waves until it was broken up. Yosef fled away upon a little boat and we were all divided upon nine until it was broken up. And we were all divided upon nine planks and Levi and Yudah were together and we were all scattered unto the ends of the earth. Then Levi, girt about with sackcloth, prayed for us all unto Yah. And when the storm ceased, the ship reached the land as it were in peace. And lo, our father came and we all rejoiced with one accord. I gotta keep going, y'all. Um, these two dreams I told to my father and he said to me, these things must be fulfilled in their season. After that, Israel hath endured many things. Then my father said unto me, I believe Elohim that Yosef liveth. For I see always that Yah numbereth him with you. And he said, weeping, Ah, me, my son, Yosef, thou liveth, though I behold thee not, and seest not Jacob that begot thee. He caused me also therefore to weep by these words. And I burned in my heart to declare that Joseph had been sold, but I feared my brethren. All right, y'all. I'll open that one up for y'all. What's your thoughts? Wow. Is another wow. Um, that they that his dream showed our, our future. Uh, what happens? Everything that happens is his entire dream was about everything that would happen from the time of their first captivity in Assyria. Well, not the first one, but with the Assyrians on mm -hmm. through. Um, through now, through to the, the end of this 400 years, and the role that Yehuda and Levi would play, and whatnot in that. So I'm I'm blown away by that. Yeah, it's tough. I'm not even front. It's tough. It is. It is hard. Hard to to see. Anyone else jump right in? Yeah, I wanted to add too. Um, in the beginning part of the vision, when you see the nation kind of like being birthed in the vision with Levi and and uh, Yehuda, it also kind of parallels to how Mashiach coming through um, Yehuda, but also Levi with Torah, like how those two have to um, be, the 12 tribes are like unified through both, you know, um, at least that's kind of what I saw from from the beginning, but then seeing how captivity came and like spread, like you know, dispersed us all across, you know. So, and we need both Levi and Yehuda to come back together with Mashiach and Torah so that we can, 
you know, be sub submitted. Absolutely. Anybody else? Jump right in, please. I just think that, you know, this is just so beautiful. Um, you know, when you just look at, you, for, for me, you know, looking at this message and it's prophetic, but then it also strengthens me because it just shows what's to come, that we're going to all get back together again. And I mean, it, it, it's just so beautiful to me because it's, it just reassures us that if we just do what we're supposed to do, if we just follow him and we submit that there's deliverance and, and that's just so beautiful. Oh yeah. I see some things in here that may um, parallel some of the prophecies from the chapter of Deuteronomy where um, it talks about the captivity that we're going to have and how we're going to be taken far away from the land, the land which you're taken from, you'll see no more. And um, in here, it talks about in the six, uh, six and seven, thus we were dispersed even to the outer limits. And um, that sounds like a little bit of a parallel to what is said in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, because I'm sure to them, this land that we were taken to had not been talked about much or known much, or it would be considered the outer limits at the time, I would think. All right, anybody else? I think some of Daniel's prophecies in here too, in regard to especially to current times. Okay. Um, I also uh, <clears throat> I also think that uh, uh, like in the book of Daniel, how uh, Daniel saw some things and most I said, shut those books up until the latter time. I'm paraphrasing it. And now you're seeing all these books come available to, mm. you know, we're seeing the prophecy and we're seeing the hand of the most high. He told us that he's going to declare the end from the beginning. Now, don't you know, during this story, it was early in our stage of us being a people and the most high is sharing all this and we can see it right now. Don't you know this is for our learning? Don't you know this is for us to increase our faith in the most high? Cast the doubt away from us far away because these books are just speaking directly to our hearts. If it ain't speaking to your heart, you must be on a rock or something. It's telling you, it's showing you exactly who you are. And also, it's letting you know that the nations have lied. They took these books away from us. Mm. You see what I'm saying? It's showing that they did this, and they know who we are because it fits us like a glove, man. Come on now. Who can deny it? And then on top of that, if you look at it, the Most High is saying right now, okay, increase the faith. Walk closer to me. Don't do as your forefathers did because I'm showing you what the end's going to be like. And I told you this from the beginning. Now, walk into this thing. Shed these things away from your heart that are not like me because if you don't, you're going to receive the curses. But if you do, you're going to walk in everlasting life and joy. The Most High is trying to give us his life. The exact peace, exact shalom, everything he has, he's trying to give it to us. And he's constantly pleading and begging for us to choose life. Y'all, we got to wake up. And the key thing how the nation's going to know and how, how we ought to know that we uh, are walking with the Most High is for the love that we have for each other. We ain't going to never get across until we start loving each other as ourselves. You remember how the Mashiach said, how, how he said, uh, uh, he gave us that last commandment. He said, I give you a new commandment. And he said, don't love me like the Torah just say, but he said, love you. I mean, love each other as I have loved you. What did the Most High do for us? He shed his life and his blood. When he was in his right, he gave up his right in order to justify us. Hallelujah. We got to stand on this word, y'all. We can't be playing with the Most High. He is real. And I'm telling you, examine your heart and, and develop that love that the Most High have for us. Because I'm telling you, you ain't going to make it in the kingdom. I ain't going to make it in the kingdom unless I love my brother and my sister and I love the Most High. 
I got to back off of this. So I'm feeling the Ruach, y'all. Amen. Um, it's 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 um, overwhelming at times when when you see the revelation hit like this. Um, just the journey we've gone through as a people. Oh my. I think one of the hardest things for me is, is the thought of, you know, Israel on the ship referred to as the ship of Yaakov and how after a season or time Yaakov was gone and the ship was battered to the point of being literally destroyed and broken up. Nine planks scattered all over the face of the of the earth. That's 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 tough. That's tough. I mean, it was prophesied what would happen to our people, and it's true. It came to pass. Um, let's 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 close this out. I'm gonna go ahead and read uh, chapters eight and nine together, and then we'll open it up for. Um, discussion and then close out in prayer chapter eight and lo my children i have shown unto you the last times how everything shall come to pass in israel do you also therefore charge your children that they be united to levi and judah for through them shall salvation arise unto israel and in them shall Jacob be blessed for through their tribes shall Elohim appear dwelling among men on earth to save the race of Israel and to gather together the righteous and to gather together the righteous from amongst the Gentiles. If you work that which is good, my children, both men and Malak or angel shall bless you. And Elohim shall be glorified among the Gentiles through you. And Hasatan shall flee from you. And the wild beast shall fear you. Yah shall love you. The Malachim shall cleave to you. As a man who has trained a child well is kept in kindly remembrance so also for the good work there is a good remembrance before Elohim. But him that doeth not that which is good, both Malak and man shall curse, and Elohim shall be dishonored amongst the Gentiles through him. And Hasatan shall make him as his own peculiar instrument, and every wild beast shall master him, and Yah shall hate him, for the commandments of the law, Torah, are twofold, and through prudence must they be fulfilled. For there is a season for a man to embrace his wife, and a season to abstain, therefore, for his prayer. So then, there are two commandments, and unless they be done in due order, they bring very great sin upon men. So also it is with the other commandments. But you, therefore, wise in Elohim, my children, but, there, but ye, therefore, wise in Elohim, my children, and prudent understanding the order of his commandments and the Torah of every word that Yah may love you. And when he hath charged them with many such words, he extorted them, he exhorted them that they should remove his bones to Hebron and that they should bury him with his fathers. And when he had eaten and drunken with a merry heart, he covered his face and died. And his sons did according to all that Naphtali, their father, had commanded them. Selah. Hallelujah. 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 Uh, go ahead. What are your thoughts on that last section? And then we'll close out in prayer. I'm going to say, again, the importance of order yeah. is that he is stressing he must do everything in order of Yah's commandments. We must not fail at that. Amen. Hallelujah. This almost feels like 
like like begging like like he's begging us to get it right with just how how precise everything is and how the, the, all the importance is laid out it's just so thorough I think it's interesting to see how uh, he was telling his sons that like if 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 we don't do that which is good and be a set apart instrument unto Yah we'll be a set apart peculiar instrument unto Hasatan uh -huh. and we look at like our culture that we've kind of cultivated here and you can see Man. how we the best at being the worst <laughs> you know and and we receive quote unquote blessings but they curses you know and these things are like weighed us down to the weight of the world and now when we try to come back you know we we, we shackled down and chained and so it's you know i just see how like even in this time we have to let go like you said all the secret things the outward things everything just cast the cares down so that we don't get caught up and so that we can float back on the boat you know um so yeah just reflecting on that too you know more when the last verses that you read and, and then the gentleman was um talking i heard um a clock chiming like it's time and i just heard this clock that kept chiming in <clears throat> verses uh, eight and ten it mm -hmm. stood out to me because it appears to be a commandment about the commandments and um it reads so be wise in the most high and discerning knowing the order of his commandments what is ordained of you in every act so that the most high will love you it sounds to me like he's um encouraging us to put first things first and to understand what is top in priority what is second what is third we have to put this foundation uh, we have to put the scaffolding up first and then the foundation in order to have things properly set and be able to put any kind of building together you know what i mean mm. let me let me ask this and throw this out there again and then we can move on that's a great point man so let's just talk about that what is the first commandment you're asking me no idols somebody to left Somebody, love, love, yeah. somebody go love yeah somebody love yeah go find it what's yeah. what's the first commandment, the yeah. commandment we had to love yah with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and have no other elohim beside him yeah. even ourselves yep yeah. even the idol of ourselves man it's deep y'all anybody else um before we close out in prayer? I did want to add one one more thing back. Um, so in the beginning, I asked about the feast. So I looked it up um, and I saw that it is a feast of trumpets at this point in time. So it's interesting to see too how he's almost like blowing the shofar, you know, before his last, with his last breath, you know, to let the, let the family know, you know, that this is what's going to happen with the nation and get yourself together. You know, so it, so I appreciate you telling me look it up so I can mm -hmm. see see that connection. Yeah, my main thing is to empower you guys. Um, like someone I stated earlier, you know, you want to learn for yourself. You want to be able to. I'm not. I'm bottom line. I'm not going to talk about what I'm not about. What I'm about is building up leaders, building you guys up, so you know for yourself that you can take this information. You could fact check it, you can research it, you could apply it and see how it works for yourself um, so that you can teach others and you can go forward that you know for yourself. The time of just, you know, sitting back and watching other folks do stuff is over with. We're gonna learn for ourselves. So if that means you gotta get online digital copies of these books, and that means you gotta go get you a $100 CFR or $15 or $20 online CFR or whatever, Go to the, the bookstore, half price books, and get you some stuff. You are learning for yourself. You're researching for yourself. Because it's going to hit harder. It's going to be uh, accepted and embraced, embraced by you um, when you 
dig a little bit deeper for yourself to find out versus just somebody telling you. Um, anybody else? There's some great points in regards to this. Um, and I, I also love how there's a call to obedience in regards to submit yourselves essentially to the order of Levi and Judah, because in them is going to become the, the salvation of the nation. And what most folks don't understand real world is that, um, yes, we're Judah. Yes, we are from the Southern Kingdom, but some of y'all ain't from the tribe of Judah. Some of y'all are from the tribe of Levi. Just keeping it real. So um, you look at what we're doing here on the continent and trying to wake up our people here in America and across the, the diaspora. That's the work of Judah. That's the work of Judah. That's the work of Levi. So we got to be obedient to what the Most High has called us to do. Don't let your voice be muted. Okay. Um, that's why I try to encourage each and every one of you when you're on these calls to speak. Don't just sit here um, idle. Participate. I want you to speak. I want to, I want to hear your voice. I want um, the ministry and those that watch these broadcasts online to hear the wisdom that the Most High has placed inside of you because um, we all have to work together and we all have to come out. So we have to work together and we've got to come out of this thing together. So um, anybody else have any last statement they want to make before we close out in prayer? Go ahead. I'd well, like to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Linda. You can go. Okay. I just like to uh, point out that the most high is reminding us that if we do these things that he are again, he's against that he would hate us for that. He says that in, uh, what is it? Eight, 28. But, but him that doeth not that which is good, both angels and men shall curse and Yah shall be dishonored among the Gentiles through him. Mm. And the devil shall make him as his own peculiar instrument and every wild beast shall master him and Yah shall hate him. That, that's piercing. You say you love the most high but what are your actions proving? And we need to remember that. That goes to another commandment of carrying his name in vain. Yeah. You literally are a disgrace, a shame, because you so-called carry the Most High's name and you are a shame to the Most High through your actions amongst the Gentiles as though you were a Gentile because you acting like these Gentiles. Anyway. All right, go ahead. Who's next? Oh, I got disconnected for a bit. So I don't know if anybody made a comment on and the angels shall cleave to you. No, go ahead. Um, it doesn't matter if they did or not. You can go ahead and expound on that. But I, um, I find that, you know, very interesting and comforting because in, in what I understand is that they will cleave to you because you are like him, you know, and they, they, you know, just want to worship him. Holy, holy, holy all day long. And, and they are drawn to him. So if you are walking in righteousness and you are in his likeness and you are, you know, a representation of him on earth and you're actually operating in your function, they're going to be drawn to you. They're going to cleave to you as it says. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought that was really powerful. That's good. And the devil will flee from you. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Were you talking about eight and four? Because it says that the angels yes. will bless yes. you. And uh, if you look at the end of that statement, that's something that we should all want in our lives. The devil will flee from you if you achieve the good. So that's our goal. I heard somebody say earlier, do we ever really get all of the things out of our life? This here is saying, if you achieve the good, that the devil will flee from you. So I'm going to rock with that. Hallelujah.
All right, fam, anybody else? I'm about 15 seconds away from closing out in prayer. All right, I do greatly appreciate your time today. Um, I really do. Um, we appreciate yours too. Thank you, Moray. Yeah. So does, does it, no, thank you, Moray. Does anyone else have a prayer request? I already have written down um, Lalisa and Felina, and I wrote down what your prayer requests were. Does anyone else have a prayer request that you would like for us to go over uh, before we close out? Yeah, Maury, I have a prayer request. I just pray that the Most High will bring His people together in closeness and in love, and 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 just just give us the heart of Him, you know, to do His will. So that's a, that's my prayer. Okay. Yeah, to trust each other like family again, because a big thing that this testament is bringing out is that it's we are a big family, and that's the biggest part of how we're gonna come back together is loving each other like family. Okay. Mine, uh, Moray, is just that um, y'all y'all will move on those that have an ear to hear and eyes to see that that Yash, those in Yashara will, will awaken. I have one too. Um, since the word keeps talking about order so much, I pray that we would all have a more thorough understanding of the order <clears throat> or a more complete understanding of the order of his commandments, of his statutes, his ordinances, his word, that it may be appropriated. I wanted to pray for more understanding. I want to pray for um, um, continued um, cleansing, um, continuing to examine ourselves and increase our faith. Yes, for Yah to completely eradicate anything within our hearts and in our lives that is not... Um, that is not beneficial to ourselves or to our walk with him or to Israel as a whole. All right, one second. Who was before uh, Brenda? Who was, who was the person that spoke a prayer before Brenda? It was a quick prayer. For understanding. And, um, Okay. Thank you. That's Natavia Amore. Yeah. All right. I take prayer very seriously, so that's why I'm, I'm taking the time to make sure I write this down. Okay. Um, and, and make sure I get it right. All right. Anybody else? All right. I'm going to go ahead and go into prayer. All right. Abiyah, uh, I thank you for this time that we have again to have this, this holy Shabbat to come together according to your will, according to your word, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. We thank you for the word that's gone forth and the discussion that was provoked. We submit ourselves to you and we just seek your will. We seek your way in and through our lives to have that full understanding. I ask for shalom to rest upon each and every house represented here today. I ask for increased provision, sustenance to every house here today. I ask for increased healing, wholeness, resting upon each house represented here today. I pray for hearts able to hear and receive the truth of your word. I pray that our hearts are holy ground, a soil of the heart able to receive the seed of your word that grows forth 
bountifully in fruitfulness, that the fruit of Torah shall manifest in our lives. Right now, I just drive out all fear, all doubt, all disunity, all disorganization. We love you, Yah, and we thank you for all that you're doing in and through our lives, for you are holy, righteous, and everlasting. Right now, I want to go ahead and lift up Melissa. I lift her up to you right now and her entire household. I pray for increased faith, trust in you, unwavering faith, that she may remain steadfast in you and able to push through to receive all that you have for her on her path of life. May she rest in divine health, healing, and wholeness in every aspect of her life. May she have the prosperity she needs to live out her days. Watch over her. Guide her by your malakim. Your malakim by your word. I thank you for it now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. And hallelujah. Right now, I lift up my sister Felina. I pray for her household and I pray for the revelation knowledge of who you are to manifest in their life. I pray for revelation of the secret things of the heart that she can have an increased level of self-reflection to, to delve deep into the things within herself, within her husband, all her children. I pray for shalom upon her house and all that she's a steward of. I pray for it now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Right now, I pray Aliyah for Jordan. Bless him and his household, all that he's a steward over. I speak shalom over his life and over his household. And I stand in agreement with him in regards to us being able to operate as a family in unity and in trust that those of us, the righteous seed, the righteous remnant of the house of Israel that are finding themselves awakening all over the earth, I pray we're able to come together in unity, peace, shalom, and trust. One family. I stand in agreement and I pray for it now in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Right now, I stand in agreement with my brother Mac for his prayer and petition, his prayer and petition that we be able to gather together the whole house of Israel, united as one, submitted unto you, reigning and ruling righteously according to your word by the authority of Hamashiach, trusting in him, trusting in you, moving on this earth by the power of your spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I want to um, lift up the prayer of my sister Mayala for you to move on each person represented here this day on this call, those that are watching by internet. Everywhere this message gets sent to, I pray that we're able to receive all that you have for us. That your word will go forth and it will bear fruit in our lives because we submit unto you. We want to be submitted to your will, seeking after your ways. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen, amen, hallelujah. I pray uh, and stand in agreement with my brother Ducey. that we as your people will truly understand the order of Torah, the order of your commandments, the order of your will for our lives and through our lives. I just pray right now that each and every house represented here today, I pray that we remove any idols we have set up in our hearts, any idols we have set up in our home, that we truly are submitted unto you 
unto righteousness because of the greater work you have planned for us to do in these in this age this is the time of victory the time of salvation is at hand the time of the kingdom is at hand and we trust in you and we thank you for all that you're doing to reign and rule and reside over our lives and that we dwell in the the safety of your arms and the comfort of you, Most High, Elohim. I thank you for it now. In the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I also lift up my sister, Natavia. I pray that she has increased levels of understanding for her and her household. Bless her. Watch over her. Speak to her. Guide her through this process. The process of understanding who you are and who she is in you that she's able to be that Proverbs 31 woman that you've called her to be. Again, for your shalom to rest upon her and her household. I ask for provision for her. And again, that hedge of protection to rest upon and encompass about her. I pray that now in the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. Amen, amen, hallelujah. I also want to lift up uh, my sister Brenda, that she has a greater level of increased faith to do what you called her to do when you called for her to do it. I pray for balance in her life. I pray for shalom in her life. I pray for boldness to everlastingly do what you called for her to do. We are eternal in you. We are eternal in you. The future is in you. We submit to your authority, your reign, your rule. And we thank you for the power that you've blessed us with to go forth and do your works. I ask for that to be done now in the name of your son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And lastly, I want to lift up my sister Alyssa. Again, I pray that um, I stand in agreement with her that you will remove any and everything that's not of you, that we stay submitted into you and dwell in your presence. For according to your word, there's no place high or low on the earth or under the earth, in the sea, where we can go where you are not there. So we trust in you. We rely on you. We ask for greater clarity of understanding in regards to who you are and our being in you. We thank you for the power, dominion, and authority you've placed upon us this day, for we are your righteous seed, your righteous remnant. We thank you for the strength to overcome the wicked. We thank you for the power residing in our mouth to destroy the wicked by your word. I thank you for it now. In the name of your son, Yahushua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Our uh, family, I appreciate you greatly. Um, you, Maury. The season. We pre Woo. appreciate Woo. Oh. Appreciate that, Maury. That was that was. It was deep, Man. huge, very deep, oh and divine. And yes, it was. Hallelujah! 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 Listen, I, I, I really, um, I asked for you to take some time out and listen to the what the Most High is speaking to you. Um, I'm in awe of the Most High. In light of everything that's happening in and around us, I want you to know that the Most High is. Um, He's with us. Yes, he is. And we are with him. And we are his remnant. Yeah. And it's something where trust in the calling, the path that he has placed you on, trust in him. All right? And know that you have brothers and sisters you can rely on that are here for you genuinely, that are here to support you. So if you have a need, if there's anything that you need, you let me know. Wrap that up your local leadership in your assembly. If you're not a part of a local assembly, but would like to get connected to a local assembly, we do have assemblies all over this nation. Uh, the ones that I'm directly steward over is gonna be Seattle, Tacoma, Portland, and Arizona assemblies. We also have assemblies in Texas, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, and Dallas. We have assemblies in Georgia. We have an assembly in South Carolina. Um, listen, get connected with us um, if you're not already. And um, 
it's time to come out. The Most High is doing a powerful work in our lives right now. So um, just keep your trust and faith in him. I thank you all that have joined us on this call. Those I can see and those I can't. May your households truly be blessed. And um, with that, I'll say shalom. Shalom. Shalom, Marie. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. 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 Shalom.